Okay. Just looking to see if I have all my speakers for today. Missing Monty. Oh, I guess we got the whole group. Excellent. Okay, so it's 7.30, so why don't we start? Uh, my name is Rich Harmon, um, and I'll be moderating this last session. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, so we're going to continue. This is our fourth and last session for the day, followed by Q&A. Uh, we have four speakers. Uh, the title of this last session is Disruptors and in Innovation, which is really about looking into the future. And as one of the speakers mentioned yesterday, disruption can be a really good thing. It, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, right? Um, so we have four speakers. Um, and I will ask them to come up to the podium as I announce them. I'll make very brief introductions so we have more time left for the actual presentation. So we have Dr. Aman Mahajan, and he is the Peter and Ava Safer Professor and Chair in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative Medicine, and Professor of Bioengineering, Biomedical Informatics at University of Pittsburgh. Then we have uh, Dr. Piyush Mather, um, and he's an anesthesiologist and intensivist at the Cleveland Clinic, and he's the quality improvement officer uh, at that institution. We got Monty Mython, um, and he is uh, Emeritus uh, Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the University of London, and among his many other titles, he is the chair of the evidence-based uh, perioperative medicine, EBPOM, um, initiative. So uh, the first pr uh, presentation is on remote patient monitoring, uh, the hospital at home. Then Dr. Mather will talk about can an algorithm support safe uh, practice. Then Do Dr. Mython will talk about professional sedation as solution or sedition. And finally, uh, our fourth speaker is uh, Dr. Patricia Trish Fogarty Mack and she's Vice Chair for Quality and uh, Safety at Cornell and Associate Professor of Clinical Anesthesiology. And she will talk about NORA, appropriate uh, metrics, current and future. So she'll be our last speaker. So I'll have our speakers come up uh, to the podium and, and we'll start with, <laughs> I'll go sit, I guess. I'll sit. Yeah, I'll sit right here. Morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for being here. I want to talk briefly this morning about uh, remote patient monitoring, just pro provide a broad overview of this latest, latest trends in this um, practice of medicine, practice of healthcare, and I'll talk a bit about um, hospital at home concept and where RPM is being used in, uh, in that setting as well as in other clinical settings. Uh, just my disclosures, uh, my research, my lab is funded by NIH, much of this work is in developing uh, biosensors, wearable technology, um, you know, AI embedded um, algorithms. And um, I've been involved in formation of some uh, companies in medtech space, and I serve as a partner in BC firm and also help guide uh, our investments uh, and diligence for UPMC Enterprises, which is our venture capital and um, uh, innovation arm for UPMC Health. Uh, I will not talk anything about what my work is and uh, but focus on the broad space of remote patient monitoring. So all of you know that we are in a uh, era that's seeing a technology re revolution as well as an increase or rise in consumerism. And if you, uh, and you, I'm sure you're all aware that companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, Verizon, 
Uh, they're all wirelessly connecting, training, speech enabling, video linking, and analyzing our patients in the consumer space. And each of them is actively trying and is getting into the healthcare space as well. In fact, Best Buy acquired Current Health for $400 million. It's a company that makes laptops, sells laptops, which is directly in healthcare now. And many of our organizations are actually working with Current Health uh, and other organizations like those for um, using RPM, remote patient monitoring, as well as building hospitals at home. If you look at the consumer expectation of what they want from a digital technology, that's grown fairly exponentially over the past decade or so. And the traditional healthcare systems and healthcare delivery models have not kept up with those consumer expectations, leading to this big gap, what I call is a digital health gap, and uh, that's now being trying to be filled in by many of these um, uh, non-traditional healthcare providers here. So what is RPM? In its simplest form, RPM is connected electronic health tool, tools that collect patient medical data, health data, in one location, typically their home, or in an ambulatory setting, and transmit it using mobile devices or cloud into a um, uh, different location for where clinical providers are, and care is rendered based on that. There are specific codes for RPM, um, which one can avail of, and um, uh, it requires certain medical devices that are approved for RPM use, um, and not just any other, any other technological device that can capture health or wellness data. So this transfer of data has been enabled, and the growth exponentially that we see right now is because the technology for the biosensors and the many different types that's become relatively inexpensive and has actually improved in its accuracy and fidelity. These different types of biosensors are either ultrasonic, mechanoelectric, bioelectric, optical sensors, or electrochemical sensors. And, and there are a whole host of other newer sensors that have been developed, especially with, uh, as AI and machine learning tools are being developed as well. So these are the sensors which really power much of the devices that you're familiar with. You use in your clinical settings in the hospital, but these devices are now migrating into the ambulatory and home settings over here. And they, they record typical information that, you, that you're familiar with, blood pressure, EKG, um, you know, temperature, blood glucose monitoring, they do provide weights and so forth. Um, and much of the clinical evidence has been collected based on these core parameters, biosignals that you use in your clinical practice. And the form factor for these devices depends upon which organ system that's being recorded from, and um, uh, certainly there are lots of that. But what's exciting and what's, um, what we're seeing as the next wave, the new wave that's gonna happen, is sensors that are more advanced, biosensors that are more advanced, uh, and largely, as I mentioned, because of um, all of them being embedded with AI and machine learning um, technologies. Um, for instance, advanced cardiac diagnostics, so you just don't have now a blood pressure uh, or EKG, but you can actually have cardiac output, ejection fraction, or uh, pulmonary artery pressure, filling pressure of the heart. Um, sensors that are uh, used by electronic signals and actually can measure and record your, uh, if you're going to have uh, gastric dysfunction or intestinal or abdominal problems here. By the way, all of these sensors are actually now in clinical use. Most of them have gotten FDA clearance or are in the process of getting FDA clearance, so, so they, they're, all, they're already all in clinical trials and clinical use. Cell phones that can actually record blood pressure, you put your finger on them, and it gives you your blood pressure here. With the advent of 5G, uh, much of, and, and wireless, uh, faster wireless, much of the computing for AR and VR devices can be done now in very small miniaturized frames, so you don't need big, bulky headsets that you were familiar with. And then certainly um, uh, AI-based technologies that help um, with analysis of uh, you know, voice as a biomarker, and that can help with um, uh, treating mental health, diagnosing mental health problems and treating them. So as you can see, there's, there's certainly, it would be a, a growth in application of where these sensors can help improve healthcare. 
and as you can see over here, this has created a uh, explosion in this ecosystem of, um, of companies that are, um, are in the healthcare space, and each one of them has its specific focus, and the, this ecosystem continues to grow rapidly. Now, a fair question to ask is, is there a, um, just the euphoria that's there in digital health companies? Do actually patients want it, consumers want it, uh, or not? If you look at uh, the growth in the recent years, and certainly aided uh, and accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the, the, the projected growth in consumers who are actually transferring their data, their health data, medical data to, uh, to clinicians or, uh, or hospitals uh, is actually projected to grow to about 70 million uh, healthcare users over the next few years. Even today, about 28, 30% of consumers of healthcare that use healthcare are actually transferring their data at least once a month using the internet. And sure enough, uh, um, COVID-19 pandemic also accelerated the use amongst clinicians um, across all specialties, um, not so as much in anesthesiology and surgery, but all other specialties uh, specifically radiology, cardiology, uh, psychiatry as being the leading ones. Um, in the two years of COVID pandemic from 2018 to 2020, uh, there was actually a threefold increase from 25% to almost 80% uh, in the use of telehealth. And RPM, which is a, the enabling technologies um, in, in the wider telehealth space, uh, that, in, that actually doubled during this period of time. Um, since the COVID restrictions um, have been eased, the use of RPM telehealth continues to be fairly high. It's come down from its peak, but still continues to be many fold higher than what it was in, uh, compared to the pre-COVID levels. So initially, the gains that were made in the RPM space were largely on the on managing chronic healthcare, conditions such as obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, and so forth. More recently, and especially COVID pandemic showed that managing acute care um, conditions was greatly facilitated by RPM and remote technologies. Um, more recently also, hospitals and healthcare uh, systems are investing in using RPM technology for acute uh, heart failure management, infections, and many other acute conditions. Um, there have been some evidence for use in the post-ICU, managing of patients post-ICU, once they're discharged from the ICU, and more recent evidence on use of this technology in the post-surgical uh, space and peri-op space as well. And I'll share some evidence to that. When you look at health systems, um, as a health system that have actually implemented RPM as, as large programs within them, systematically um, in, implemented uh, RPM programs within their system. Um, and a recent research report on that, 37 of them, when they were queried, 30 per, of those, 38%, and these are all systems that represent, or many of them are represented here, 30% actually reported reduced admissions, 25% uh, cited improvements in patient satisfaction, and 25% reported cost reductions. And there have been several uh, papers, individual papers, which also show similar results on that. So why is it that RPM has been so successful? And one big reason is it actually allows fairly comprehensive management of healthcare with patients fully engaged in their own, own care. And that's through connecting with the patients, engaging them with you know, using captivating or intuitive programs, educating them with current and relevant information pertaining to their disease, guiding them, guiding their patient, their behavior um, you know, based on the outcomes, and certainly monitoring them uh, and monitoring the patient biometrics as evidence-based guidelines are implemented, and then intervening them as is needed. So it's a very comprehensive management program with, with patient being involved in their care on a day-to-day, -day, weekly basis. Think about it if this was to be a pain physician or an acute pain physician or a chronic pain physician or a perioperative physician who's engaging with them or an intensivist managing these patients at home once they're discharged from their care. That could be quite 
uh, beneficial for the anesthesiology specialty, but most, mostly beneficial for the patients and the health system to provide that continuity that's needed, and certainly an expansion of the practice. This is one of those places where technologies and healthcare platforms where most of the stakeholders are benefited. Patients like it a lot. Uh, they get timely diagnosis. Outcomes have been shown to be improved for them. They're satisfied. Uh, there's certainly provider satisfaction. Physicians, clinicians, um, like it a lot. Um, there's certainly an improved engagement we've seen with these programs, as of many other hospitals. Um, and um, uh, you know, certainly there's no dearth of nurses right now. There's a shortage of nurses working in the hospitals, but we have no problems in recruiting nurses for, for uh, programs that involve uh, RPM. Uh, hospitals that are struggling with the capacity management and staffing certainly benefit from that. And more importantly, the payers like it because it's been shown to improve costs, reduce costs, and improve outcomes for patients. And as an example, uh, this is um, uh, United Healthcare uh, funding a program. So there are several, several programs that are being designed just for the payers. And here in this case, uh, uh, you know, Tennessee, where we are at uh, today, actually has one of the l lower uh, maternal um, outcomes, um, uh, peripartum outcomes in the country. And they actually funded a program um, on improving, um, uh, improving maternal as well as perinatal uh, outcomes um, in the state uh, using wireless uh, health technologies and RPM. And Humana, Cigna, and others all have programs similar to that. So I want to also talk briefly about a specific program, which is the hospital at home, or it's the acute care hospital at home model, which, is, um, uh, which has been funded by CMS. And every hospital has to apply for that. It has specific requirements. Um, and they're also, I mean, they're all available at the uh, CMS website. Um, they're not rigorous, regimented guidelines, but the CMS provides overarching uh, goals and specifications that hospitals have to meet in order to qualify for being a hospital at home. Briefly, patients need to be admitted to the program from either an emergency department and or from an inpatient hospital bed. And uh, that has certainly helped manage offload um, you know, hospitals' um, you know, capacity issues and um, uh, enable patients to be get treated with same hospital level care uh, at home. And RPM technologies have enabled uh, that transition to occur in a, in a fairly effective and meaningful way. One of the core requirements is that uh, the hospital should be able to be responsive to emergencies, and, you know, typically within 30 minutes or so. So not hospitals perhaps can qualify for that, but many hospitals across the country are actually seeking out to become, to get the CMS waiver on and, and become an acute care hospital at home model. And this program, as you can envision, was uh, again accelerated, started and accelerated by the COVID pandemic in 2020 and uh, continues to get paid. Hospitals are required to track patient safety metrics. And of course now, with advancing advancements in AI and machine learning tools, methodologies, uh, many of these groups have created sophisticated dashboards and insights that can provide in improving uh, patient care and uh, healthcare delivery. Patients uh, stay connected to their care teams with seamlessly on-demand uh, call, video, or messaging. And that's, again, one of the requirements is that communication could be established on-demand. And then finally, the hospital at home programs do require that many services can be delivered at home. So clinical services can be delivered at home. And um, uh, many of these services are, are listed over here. And hospitals are seeking partnership with either local groups. They can have, they can certainly build their own services, but they're also in this ecosystem that's evolving, partnering with local healthcare to deliver more effective, timely care to patients at home. So while you know technology has been given credit for uh, you know this this acceleration, acceleration and explosion of care uh, in the RPM hospital at home space. Space. A lot of it is actually the credit goes towards creating the right processes, workflows, um, and understanding what it takes to manage patients at home. So we have to train the clinical work workspace, uh, clinical workforce in managing patients' health in their home setting as well. 
at UPNC. You know, we are a 40 plus hospital system. Uh, we are a payer provider, so we have our own, insur our own health insurance plan with 4 million patients. Um, so we've created a um, innovative home care solution that's a, a separate 5013C uh, group that, that provides different aspects, different types of uh, care uh, in telehealth. Yeah, we have a connected care model, which is completely virtual care, uh, fully st staffed by nurses and uh, clinicians, uh, but care is all virtual. Uh, make sure that we manage acute or chronic conditions um, and keep the patients on a, on a evidence-based uh, clinical pathways. The advanced illness care model, which is really uh, palliative care being provided at home. And then we have the acute uh, in-home, acute care model, which, uh, which provides acute care at home, and this includes elements of, um, of hospital at home model over here. And all of these things are linked to, these programs are linked uh, seamlessly to all these services that are provided by our health plan, as well as our uh, various uh, hospitals within Pittsburgh and around the, the other states. So as I mentioned to you, developing the right workflow is really important. For instance, um, in our in-home acute care model, patients, um, uh, a, pa a patient provider um, or a patient uh, discharge triggers uh, a in-home care model, and within three hours, um, our our teams uh, in the um, in the RPM space will reach out to the patient, establish clinical contact, make the clinical assessment in their home, um, advise on what different uh, RPM technologies are needed, what tests are done. They're all provided there. Patients are always connected to um, to clinicians, um, and um, uh, much of this thing is managed by nurses, hospitalists, and perioperative physicians for the surgical patients. Um, and um, uh, we make sure that we, as we are managing patients' health from a medical standpoint, we are also actually addressing the social determinants of care. So that's, again, a, a very important component that we've seen has improved patients' overall health. And, and the outcomes, uh, as has been seen in many other hospitals, have systems that have uh, implemented this. Uh, you know, our seven-day ED return has gone down, 30-day, 90-day readmission rate, all those uh, metrics that one would uh, care about and are reflective of improved healthcare outcomes have, have improved with this model as compared to traditional care. Just sharing some of the activity um, and uh, research that's being done in the surgical field. Uh, this is, again, a randomized uh, clinical tri trial done in two hospitals in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia area. Um, um, patients, uh, 250 patients, 40 patients randomized to either standard of care or to being discharged um, with RPM, with, with monitors, uh, uh, largely activity monitoring uh, and text messaging uh, following discharge. Uh, and the key uh, finding on this is that the, um, uh, they noted that the rehospitalization rate uh, was much lower in patients that were discharged with RPM. Another uh, clinical trial, a uh, randomized clinical trial, trial done with about uh, 450 patients in each arm. This was done in eight hospitals in Canada, uh, non-elective surgery. These patients were discharged in 24 hours, again, standard of care, or with RPM monitors and they were given a toolkit uh, which has which has all the monitors that would provide them EKG partition and other monitors in there. Um, and um, uh, the key finding in this was that the patients who were discharged with RPM, um, there was a better likelihood of detecting drug errors, uh, correcting the drug errors for these patients when they were at home. Um, certainly uh, these patients um, uh, it, um, had much less pain um, as it was getting more actively managed by, um, by RPM um, and uh, virtual health technologies. Anesthesiologists have uh, spent more recently a focus on the um, use of RPM uh, and decision support in the hospital settings, and I'll share some data on that. Um, much of this is in early validation trials, uh, small cohort pilot studies showing that the RPM technologies used in hospital settings 
uh, how accurate they are as compared to wired monitors. Um, and uh, the key finding over here is that while the heart rate monitoring EKGs, pulse oximeters, they're fairly close to what uh, wired monitors are, um, the respiratory monitoring uh, rate may not be as accurate. Um, it's reasonable, but it's not that accurate as compared to um, um, inpatient monitoring. Uh, there's some drop in wireless signal connectivity that exists in some of these monitors, and, but all of these things are gonna get improved very soon. It's another study which uh, is in the process of happening, uh, where they're using a different type of patch monitor which provides oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, heart rate, body temperature, and blood pressure all in one sensor uh, being tested in post-surgical setting um, uh, to see its efficacy and effectiveness. Um, a more recent study using AlertWatch as a decision support system, and many of you are familiar with AlertWatch. Uh, this was uh, done in uh, the Boston hospitals with um, close to 4,000 patients. An observational study uh, where the investigators designed specific algorithms for alerting clinicians um, uh, with patients who were on post-surgical on floor, uh, recognizing that on floor, on ward monitoring is not frequent enough, especially with the nursing shortages that we see. And their uh, observation was that the sophisticated smart alerts were able to um, provide clinicians the right information at the right time, leading to uh, improved care management. I mentioned many of you are familiar with AlertWatch. Again, this is a, uh, a decision support system, a remote monitoring uh, system that um, consumes information from uh, hospitals, um, ORs, physiological monitors, uh, certainly being implemented on the wards, as I mentioned, also on uh, labor and delivery floors in the ICUs, different settings. Information comes in real time from physiological monitors, from patients' EMR, laboratory results as they've been happening and from the AIMS, and uh, provides, um, um, based on the um, uh, inputs that um, are, are provided by the clinician, can guide uh, and observe um, uh, patients' uh, well-being and you know, where the different body systems are, physiological systems are, and provide feedback to the care team on that. Uh, there's several studies in different institutions that evidence is being um, you know, built upon. Uh, more recently, um, there has been um, use of AI and computer vision in the operating rooms. And this involves, um, again, consuming information from multiple different sources uh, in real time, uh, completely de-identifying them. In fact, they actually completely create ghosting of all individuals, so you can't recognize who the person is. And, um, um, and certainly uh, acquiring information from uh, activities on the anesthesia personnel as well as on the surgical field and, um, and, and creating insights into the team's performance as well as individual performance and um, you know, providing guidance in real time or, or, or afterwards. And you know, certainly dashboards which can provide this information um, uh, to enhance uh, anesthesia, surgical team performance, safety, and training and efficiency over a period of time. Uh, this um, was developed out of Canada with a group called Surgical Safety Technologies um, and uh, been implemented and used currently in many hospitals within the United States. One thing I would actually mention is that while anesthesiology and surgery, we are all focusing a lot on using RPMs within the hospital space, um, much of care is getting shifted from the hospitals into ambulatory settings, into the offices, into the home. I think we need to be cognizant about that and how we actually evolve as a specialty and, and be there where the patients are moving and the care is moving. It's not that hospitals are going away, it's just that much of the care is being transferred into many of these low acuity settings. Challenges and limitations remain, and those are listed over here, uh, as would be, would be with any new enabling technology. I think for anesthesiology and its practices, and be that preoperative, postoperative pain, or post-ICU, and others, 
the challenge remains to adapt to the shifting healthcare landscape and how we use these new enabling technologies in expanding uh, the scope of the practice as well as, as making sure that we can afford the same level of safety and benefits to the patient uh, rendering, uh, when we render care for them as well. So uh, there's irony and uh, humor in, in this, um, and we don't know where this thing will eventually go, but certainly um, um, digital health technology is going to be a big part of our practice for the future. Thank you very much. And Aman, when you talked about this home thing, are you suggesting that Nora location should include home? Should we go that big? Maybe not yet, but, but that might be coming, but wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Dr. Warner uh, set up the stage for all the data that we are inputting. You know, we are one of the most expensive data entry people in the world. So we input all this data, and, and he illustrated how you can use that data. And today, Dr. Mahajan came and talked about algorithms and AI, so that perfectly set the stage for, for me to follow, asking these questions, or asking the question that can AI support safe practice? And uh, when I was asked to talk about this, I had to go back in literature to see, well, algorithms are not just AI, right? A algorithms have existed forever, so I'll start off with, uh, my disclosure, oops. Uh, so a couple of uh, founder uh, company disclosures. Uh, again, just to clarify, I'm a physician. I get a lot of LinkedIn algorithm invites for jobs for engineers, and I'm not an engineer. So I do write AI software, but I'm not an engineer. So I'm still a physician. But algorithms have existed in many forms for a long period of time. So one of the misconceptions these days is that algorithms are same as AI. Well, AI are a different group of algorithms, but algorithms have been in use forever. We have used rule-based algorithms, we have used standard algorithms forever, and that's why I try to differentiate between the two fields. And AI is a more newer, evolving field for healthcare. But as I said, you are using algorithm every single day. Right now, all of you who are on your phones and your devices and other things, you are using your, your algorithms. You know, they're sending you these curated emails and you're responding to those. And in, in your workspace, you are using algorithms when you're using these devices. So I hear this all the time. I don't need algorithm. I'm a physician. I'm smart. I'm experienced. Well, okay, you are. That's just the reality of it. You've been using it. And since they've existed for a long time, have we ever asked this question? Have they been safe? Yes, we have asked this question many times. And if you see the recent growing evidence, it seems like we need to go back and look at these algorithms again, that even the current algorithms in our practice and use, are they safe? And here's an example of pulse ox. We have used pulse ox forever. And we took it for granted, like, yes, whatever it tells me, the, the random number that it generates uh, out of this, uh, is that true? I don't know if it is true or not, and we depend upon a lot of validation to know whether it is true or not, and what we're finding out, that in some circumstances, it may or may not be true. So I think it does require further, further review to learn about it. Now, what about AI-based algorithms? AI-based algorithms are proliferating like crazy. Look at how much research is going in over there. And this is not just for anesthesiology, this is for all practices. We combine anesthesiology with critical care, with surgery. Think about the perioperative space. The number of publications, the amount of research going on in AI-based algorithms is expanding exponentially. And while there is a lot of research going on in this space, even the quality of research, so you look at the quantity, which is in blue, and you look at the quality, which is like high quality models, uh, AI models that are being proposed over there, is also expanding exponentially. So these algorithms are getting more and more mature, but are they safe? That's the question that, that we are trying to address. Well, FDA has been approving them, so they must be safe, right? 
right? Well, what about pulse ox? Let's think about that. What about some of the recent evidence for these algorithms? So this is a recent publication made, made a lot of press that for sepsis, which is a big killer in our hospitals, you know, around 50%, 25 to 50% mortality is from sepsis. So for dealing with a problem as significant as sepsis, there are these algorithms that are coming along. Some have been criticized for not working well, but then here they have demonstrated that yes, they can be safe and effective, and this is on, based on a randomized multi-center multi study. But again, clearly more work needs to be done in this space. Okay, so we designed the algorithm, we proved that it works well. Will you use it? This is from our shop, where we used a, per, a particular uh, algorithm which predicts hypotension, and it, this, this is there, available in devices right now. And half the alerts that that algorithm generated were not followed. Maybe we don't believe in, we are the Cleveland Clinic, so we don't need to use algorithms. Maybe that's, we are smarter. But look at the value of those algorithms. If you would have intervened, you know, maybe you could have prevented things. That guidance was, was right in a, more, a lot of those cases. So why didn't you? So will clinicians adopt algorithms? Well, that's still a question that needs to be answered. What about high-skill decision-making? Because, yeah, I don't need algorithm for little stuff. I need it for, like, complicated stuff, like doing those echocardiograms. What about that? So here is a publication from a few years ago where they developed AI-based algorithms that will read echocardiogram and tell you what the EF is. And, of course, there are now many more algorithms that will do even more. Go beyond EF. Tell you a lot more. It will compute a lot of different indices that you, you try to calculate on your cell phones or otherwise. And here, what they found was that compared to the echocardiographers, it was pretty good. Pretty good, right? Okay, that sounds great, but how do I use it? What about the clinical workspace use? How am I gonna do it? Here is a study where they had two groups of individuals unskilled nurses, unskilled nurses as in nurses who are not trained in using echocardiogram. They have not been trained in that. And the other group of nurses who were, oh, sorry, who, and, and these uh, nurses have no exposure to echocardiogram in the past. And the other one are the, the echocardiographers. And they compared them. The nurses who were not trained in use of echocardiogram, they were given AI-based echocardiogram or devices. And they were pretty good. So you can have nurses do echocardiograms, and they will generate pretty good results similar to your echo techs. Now think about all the workforce challenges that we are facing. Think about real-time data, real-time information that you need, and think about democratizing skill sets. And if you're worried about algorithms, well, the robots are coming too. So on the right side, what you can see is a deep learning algorithm that is embedded in an ultrasound that helps the robot get you IV access. Now think about how many times you have to poke some of these patients. Maybe that robot can help me with the, those difficult IV challenges. So it's not just algorithms but the application of these algorithms that are evolving too. And on the other side, you can see how these algorithms are helping us do guided nerve blocks. So you're not just doing it blindly or guessing, it's guiding your nerve blocks. You use these algorithms every single day in your GPS, right? You use them every single day, so why not for your other devices? So they are coming. Can algorithms help us listen to our patients in a better way. So Dr. Wanderer said he collects patient experience data. We collect patient experience data too, and we collect a lot of comments. So what we did was we took two different AI algorithms, put them together, fed 15,000 patient comments into it, 
to understand what are our patients trying to say when we did it with humans, when it did, we did it with our residents, trying to annotate those, or trying to, to analyze those, took us four months, four months. This algorithm, less than one minute, told us which categories of issues we need to deal with. And those you can So you take the data, feed through the algorithms, listen to your patients, and you have actionable information which will help your quality improvement or patient experience efforts. And this is something that we have worked on recently. This is not AI-based, this is non-AI-based, rule-based algorithms. This, just like Dr. Wanderer mentioned yesterday, we use workbench reporting in Epic. We created these algorithms that run in the background in our Epic EHR, and they pick out or they sniff out quality and safety events and they report it. So we looked at few of the quality and safety events that happen in the operating room, like cardiac arrest, hypotension, and airway event. And we said, we don't need physicians to report these events. Let's see if we can automate the reporting. So yes, we do have manual reporting of quality and safety events, but we wanted to have an additional layer of automated reporting and look at the difference. For something as significant as cardiac arrest in the operating room, you can see the yellow bar which represents manual reporting, and the red bar, which represents the automated reporting. Look at the difference. So now you can take the data, have your algorithm process it, convert it into meaningful information, and I can then help provide better quality of care in those targeted areas. So think about NARA. You are having all these events, but manually people are not necessarily reporting them, but if you can have automated reporting, now you have actionable information. Maybe I need to focus a little bit more on my MRI suite rather than my IR one. I think my IR one is doing okay. Or what can I learn from my IR suite or bronchoscopy suite and put it in the GI suite? So think about how you can make your, safe, your practices safer using some of these algorithms. But what it needs is the vision and leadership, and that's the case I tried to make a few years ago. Don't be afraid of AI. Don't be afraid of all these hard, hard or difficult terms. There are a lot of publications that are coming out. I think we need to understand that. There are a lot of these devices and algorithms that are coming in our clinical space. We, as somebody who are responsible to our patients, need to make sure that we are engaged, we are educated, and we validate these algorithms. So even if you don't understand a lot of this, we should make sure that we do that safety check before we adopt these. And that's what we put forth a few years ago over here. And uh, I've been happy to be a part of a few international frameworks that have come along about evaluation of these AI algorithms so that we are not just mindless adopting them, but we are meaningfully analyzing them, meaningfully evaluating them all the way from the concept phase to the deployment, maintenance, and further, so that we are getting the right information, we are making sure that these algorithms are working correctly and helping us and our patients. So a couple of publications that have come about proposing these frameworks uh, that are there in use. And what was exciting for me to see is that while we are evaluating these algorithms, going back to this hypotension prediction index, the editors uh, for this particular article suggested the use of the evaluation framework that I just mentioned, the Decide AI one, that we should use frameworks like that. So already our specialty is on the right path, asking the right questions and trying to determine what we need to do to make sure that these algorithms that are providing with great information are providing uh, the right information and for safe care. So in conclusion, these algorithms have been here, are here. Uh, validation is extremely important. You know, clinician leadership, working with our engineering groups is extremely important. Mindful application of evaluation frameworks is the need of the hour. And can algorithms help deliver safe care? That's the question I want you to think about and, and try to answer. And the larger question that still remains in my mind, whether they can help save lives. Again, it's up to us, it's upon us 
to try to answer that question. Algorithms are not going to do it by themselves. We have to design those solutions for our patients. So thank you very much. to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about the professional sedationists, and I've titled this Sedation Solution or Sedition. So as you've heard, I'm Monty Mython. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at University College London. I just stood down as the chair after 20 plus years uh, at University College London, and prior to that I was on faculty at Duke University Medical Centre in Durham in the USA. So I, I have some degree of understanding of working on both sides of the the big pond. There will be a few spellings in this that uh, you might disagree with, but we won't concentrate on that too much. Uh, a key conflict of interest, although I'm not going to discuss it in this talk, is I'm currently on sabbatical and I'm a paid consultant for Edwards Life Sciences, working on efficient trial design and artificial intelligence applied to hemodynamic instability. Happy to discuss that later if you choose. A couple of other key conflicts, although I don't think they're relevant to this talk. I'm the founding director of evidence-based perioperative medicine, and I'm still in that role, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And I'm the founding co-editor-in-chief, along with Desiree Chappell, who's in the room, of TopMed Talk, which is a free open access medical education podcast, uh, which uh, is got thousands of free podcasts on it. We're just getting close to our two million downloads after just going for a few years. And there are a number of podcast recorded on there about what we're discussing today, including the sedationist. So what is sedation? Well, here's a, a couple of definitions taken from an article in BJA Education. Procedural sedation supports the delivery of investigations and procedures that patients might be otherwise unable to tolerate, and I'll show you an example in a moment. Whereas general anesthesia is characterized by a lack of response to surgical stimulus Minor surgical procedures supported by cessation still require effective local regional anesthesia. So we've kind of agreed around the world what anesthesia is, and it used to be, you know, asleep, don't remember it, and you don't withdraw to a surgical stimulus. That's now been modified a little bit, and some of that might be territorial, to say if you're doing this regional thing which stops you withdrawing, it's still an anesthetic. Here is a, a, another quote from that article that I referred to, uh, which refers to another article. This will make sense in a second. An international consensus statement was deemed to be necessary as we get into discussions about what, what constitutes sedation. And in this article, it says that the uh, procedural sedation was defined as to facilitate a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure with a target state in which, and this is important to remember for this talk, airway patency, spontaneous respiration, protective airway reflexes and hemodynamic stability are preserved while alleviating anxiety and pain. So if your airway isn't patent, it's not preserved, and you're not responsive, and you're not hemodynamically stable, you're not sedated, you're something else, if you see what I mean. That's very important. These carefully, the final thing is from Rob Sneed, who wrote this article and has been party to writing many of the international guidelines on sedation. He's a professor of anesthesia, now emeritus in the United Kingdom. These carefully crafted phrases reflect a clear separation from anesthesia and avoid territorial claims for particular professional groups. Now, in the sedation room, there is a small herd of elephants that I will refer to in passing. And I see some of you grinning in the room already, saying, be careful, Monty. You do realize you're in the USA. So here is um, somebody who may or may not be sedated under, undergoing an endoscopic procedure. So they have a gag in their mouth. The, uh, they have uh, some entitled CO2 monitoring. There's somebody else in the photograph holding a syringe full of a clear liquid with a big needle on it. So this probably isn't real, but it's, you know, we know what we're talking about here. And uh, the challenge we have with sedation is we've agreed what an anesthetic is you know, sort of you're asleep, you don't remember it, and you don't withdraw to a surgical stimulus. We've modified that to include some regional stuff, so you don't withdraw to a surgical stimulus. Now we have to define sedation. 
And whether you look at the US guidelines or you look at the UK guidelines or the European guidelines, broadly speaking, sedation is defined as something that's called procedural or, uh, sorry, um, conscious or mild or moderate or, or deep sedation, however you want to phrase those three things. Now, as you get to the mild, you know, the mildly sedated or procedural sedation, the idea is that Frank here, you whisper in Frank's ear, Frank, Frank, and he squeezes my finger to say, I'm okay, Monty. You know, this, this, I'm tolerating this procedure. I'm sedated. I can hear you saying my name, and I'm squeezing your finger reassuringly. That's sort of the mild sedation bit. The moderate bit is that you have to shout a little bit louder and possibly squeeze Frank's ear to get him to just gently flicker his eyelids. And maybe that's moderate sedation. But what's deep sedation? Deep sedation is when Frank's no longer necessarily responding to my stimulus. He's not necessarily protecting his airway. He's not necessarily breathing normally, and he's not necessarily hemodynamically stable. Well, according to the definition I showed you at the beginning, that is not sedation. That is something else. So in our guidelines in the United Kingdom, we've now said that an anesthetic is an anesthetic is an anesthetic. We set standards for anesthesia, and they should be applied absolutely everywhere. There are no excuses. And deep sedation is an anesthetic because it's not sedation, so therefore it's got to be something else, and therefore we think it's more dangerous, so we've called it an anesthetic. I'll come back to that in a second. So why have I put at the beginning the professional sedationist sedition Sorry, solution or sedition. Well, we have a workforce crisis in the United Kingdom, which appears to be a global workforce crisis. I'm hearing similar noises in the USA as I travel around. And part of that is thought to be post-COVID burnout. So this particular article refers to senior experienced staff crying with frustration and anger as they're being asked to give up their holidays and do extra shifts and still being shouted at by patients and relatives because they're not happy with what's going on. And it's in the UK, it's called the Great Retirement. So there's been a huge number of people who've decided to leave clinical practice and go and do something else. As a result of that, our waiting lists, which are always you know, historically quite long in the United Kingdom, you can have a debate about that, but having worked around the world, I think a bit of a waiting list is a pretty good thing because it's remarkable how much back pain gets better before surgery if you have a bit of a waiting list. Now, in the UK, we've always had a bit of a waiting list. So if you go back to 2010, for example, in central London, you might have to have waited three months, three months to have your coronary artery bypass graft surgery done on the National Health Service. But you didn't wait two years. And if you needed it done today, you had it done today. But now we're seeing the waiting list creep up to a level that's not acceptable. So in other words, we're getting out of control with the backlog of surgery, and we're not clear how we're going to deal with it. Even if we had the money available, which is another debate as we look at our fuel costs that are burgeoning the country now, we're not clear who's going to do the work. So this is from the Royal College of Anaesthetists, and until relatively recently, I was a council member of the Royal College of Anaesthetists and the national clinical lead for perioperative medicine. And the Royal College of Anaesthetists in the United Kingdom uh, is appointed by Royal Charter and reports the General Medical Council and is rep responsible for training, education and professional standards. It also produces some guidelines, but it's responsible for the standards. In other words, the stuff that dictates the, the law, the absolute requirements. So here's the report of what they believe is the UK. I think my battery might be going. And they look at the workforce in 2020. The sort of executive summary is there's currently a short of 1,400 anaesthetists in the UK. Now, we're about a fifth to a sixth of the size of the USA. We have a population of about 60 million, so you can scale these things up and down, potentially, um, depending on who's doing the counting. But at the moment, we're so short of anaesthesia providers that we're anticipating that's going to result in a delay of an extra million procedures. So that gets into the national press. But what are we going to do about it? Well, we've got to do something very dramatic, because by 2040, we're predicting that we'll need 25,500 anaesthetists. At the moment, we're on target to have 14,500, which means we'll have a shortage of 11,000. So that's a difficult problem to fix quickly. Now, something I should add at this moment is in the United Kingdom, traditionally, anaesthesia providers have all been physicians. 
we have doggedly resisted, fearful of other people injecting drugs into people to make them sleepy over the decades, that anyone other than a doctor who's been to medical school for six years and then has done an extra in the UK when I trained, 12 years of training before they become an attending, are the only people who are suitable to provide anaesthesia services. Well, we've had a wake-up moment recently, and for the first time ever, we've accepted the concept of having non-physician anaesthesia providers, because we can't see of any other way of solving the problem and the challenge that we face. And we've embraced that with enthusiasm, but what we've decided to do is to go down the physician anaesthesia assistant route, not the nurse anaesthetist route. And the reason for that is not that we wouldn't love to have nurses doing anaesthetics alongside us, but we don't have enough nurses. So we don't want to take away from that pool either. So we've decided to train science graduates who are not in medical school or nursing school to become physician assistants anaesthesia who will be supervised at, say, at sometimes remotely by physician anaesthesia providers, what you call anaesthesiologists, we call anaesthetists. And the reason we've had to do that is, as it stands at the moment, two-thirds of hospital patients are touched by an anaesthesia provider. Look at the broad spectrum. I need to change, is my mic going in and out? Do I need to change the battery on it? You're okay, okay. Um, we look at out of hospital, maternity, pain services, intensive care, Psychiatry, dentistry that's been touched on this meeting is very familiar to it. We, we are basically now all over the place. We are the group of clinicians that deal with more patients than any other um, group of providers in the country, which makes us now quite politically powerful as well. Should I change that, Patty? Is it drifting in and out? Mike? One, two? Okay, great, thank you. I think it's interfering with the other mic. I think it was the mention of non-physician anesthesia providers. They turned the switches off. <laughs> um, so, so let's get back to the sedation challenge, because one of the reasons there aren't enough of us is because we've been drawn heavily into the sedation world, because our rules say that not only should we be around if the sedation's a bit deeper, but we should be the sort of responsible officers for the provision of the services. So let's look here at just a, a selection of, this is a systematic review of recommendations for routine gastrointestinal endoscopy with regard to sedation procedures. And you can see from this abbreviated list of the number of standards that are available in this particular meta-analysis how clear we are about the challenges of sedation. So all of these different bodies have a slightly different view on what's okay. Here's a summary of recommendations of individual capable of administering sedation. And you've got their moderate and deep sedation. This is just a snapshot. And the top one says moderate sedation can be administered by a nurse who's directed by a physician. The second one down, a different guideline, said should be administered by a practitioner other than the endoscopist. When you get to deep sedation, it said should be administered by an anesthesia professional, which you might as well say it's an anesthetic deep sedation. If you then get to the other elephant in the room, and that is who's allowed to administer propofol, which internationally is highly contentious. Now, propofol probably became most fam famous because of Michael Jackson and his physician provider deciding to use it as some form of sleep aid, which uh, got it into the international press and hearing from Steve Schaefer about whether it's an anesthetic drug or not. But it's highly controversial in this context. So there are some providers in certain countries that say, why shouldn't we be able to give propofol? In other places, it, is, it must only given by, be given by uh, an anaesthet, a professional anaesthetist. I'm just going to touch on this as a last few minutes. This is from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, and I found this during my research building up to this. I've been very aware in social media of some of the tensions that we perceive from overseas between different bodies that provide anesthesia in the USA. It's been unfamiliar to us in the UK. It's been more familiar to us who've worked in the USA. This idea that there are two bodies who are potentially competing in certain areas. And I know this is 
uh, tiger country, but I've got to go there for a second. So this is from the ASA, who should administer my sedation or anesthesia? Light or moderate sedation is usually okay to be done by a nurse under the direction of a gastroenterologist. This is in the GI context. But if it's going to be deeper, it's important you get a physician anesthesiologist because you need that person who's a medical doctor who has extensive education, training, and experience to adjust medication during deep sedation and intervene to assist your breathing as needed. And that reads to me as a territorial statement, and that's kind of where we were in the UK for the fear of our territory being invaded. But as we heard from the first case that was presented at the opening of this meeting, there was nothing about the education, training, and experience that stopped the individual that was responsible for that case for looking on their iPhone and showing pictures of their grandchildren to the other people in the room. Medical school didn't help them doing that. It was all down to the vigilance of the individual. It's all down to the training experience of the individual. That's what it really matters. So how do I see the UK perioperative workforce in the future? This is a personal view. I think the department that I've just stood down from in the near future, I think we're actually there, will have three forms of professional providers. It will have perioperative physicians. So as of a number of years ago in my national lead role at the Royal College of Anaesthetists, the General Medical Council concluded that people who receive as doctors receive their fellowship of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, they are uniquely trained as perioperative physicians and other people who choose to be in that space must match their training. But that role is to deploy all of your physicianly skills you've accumulated over the decades to look after patients from contemplation of surgery to full recovery. Now, some people within that will say, I choose not to do that holistic role. I choose to be the traditional anesthesiologist or anaesthetist. And within that, there will be people who are subspecialized, as they are at the moment, cardiac, obstetric, maxillofacial, et cetera, et cetera. Not to undermine the importance of that, but we no longer believe that that's an exclusive physicianly skill. There's going to have to be some gradation within that to recognize the fact that there's a complexity level that you get down to, that you can take somebody who's trained for a shorter period of time, that we need to deliver that safely. And then we have below that the professional sedationist. We piloted that for a number of years, and our professional sedation team at the hospital that I left is led by somebody who went through that alternative training route. And our quality of sedation has gone up and up, and our safety has gone up and up, because the professional sedationists are really, really good at it, because it's what they do every day of the week. They're supervised by alternative providers who accept the responsibility of that care, and that, in my opinion, drives up the quality and the safety. I think the drugs and devices are coming to make this a lot easier and a lot safer, and we've been hearing about that in this meeting. I think the education, training, and standards are there. And in the UK, as I said, we've taken this approach whereby sedation standards are written by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges that includes all specialties. So whichever area you come from, the Joint Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, if you read that, it sets the standards for the mild and moderate category. And when it gets to deep sedation, it says C anesthesia. In the anesthesia standards, it says an anesthetic is an anesthetic is an anesthetic, and deep sedation is an anesthetic. Back off. So that's the territory defined. So there's my final thought, the UK perioperative workforce of the future. I look forward to discussing it, and thank you for listening. I apologize about the mic difficulties. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's good? Great. Thanks very much to the planning committee for the kind invitation. Um, I don't have any disclosures except for some uh, medical legal expert work, which I didn't list. Um, so I get to conclude the meeting with a talk about NORA quality metrics. Where are we now and where should we be going? And I think that you'll hear echoes of a lot of the previous talks of the meeting. Um, and I bet that at the end of my talk, we'll be left with more questions than answers, because I have a lot of questions. Um, the one thing that I found about quality metrics that I find somewhat frustrating is that um, it doesn't really have a great definition, right? There's operational metrics, there's safety metrics, and there's quality metrics. So I'm going to touch on each of these areas and see if we can uh, come up with some ideas about how to unite them. 
Um, so operations. Um, my goal would be that we would all have standardized metrics in all areas of operations, whether they're in NORA sites or peri, you know, periop areas, standardized expectations and accountability for failing to meet those metrics. Um, I'll just touch on this. Everybody knows that, you know, that the uh, non-operating room anesthesia uh, cases have been going up. This is a screenshot of one of our NORA site utilization reports. And this is one of our major operational metrics um, that we've followed. And it shows that certain areas, which you know, are identified here, some of them have very poor utilization in a 10-hour day. And so when we're deploying resources, um, you could see, for example, uh, INR in green, they have three rooms, but each of those rooms is utilized you know, less than 50% of the time. Do we have some areas for consolidation? And which areas are sort of really high in their utilization and might require more resources from us? Uh, this is one of the metrics that can be followed. Um, also, we have an after 5 p.m. report, um, which shows you know, where we need to be. And then this final slide in this operational area is something that we've used. This is all in interventional neuroradiology. And these are three individual radiologists and their um, ability to start on time and how that impacts their ability to end on time. And so we did go to uh, the chief of that service and say, you know, we really can't be here um, uh, electively after 5 p.m. It's a strain on our team. Um, we have to send a, a separate uh, anesthesiologist there because we don't want someone covering the call team on different floors. And so could you please start on time? You could see the person three has a better on time start fraction and also tends to finish on time. And we were able to make some headway with this data. So operational data can be extremely useful um, for us in terms of coverage, which does impact patient safety, that we know from many other articles about you know, nighttime, weekend, and uh, other coverage ratios. Um, one thing that's a challenge in our institution, all that data was from our previous EMR, um, is how we see procedures. And we recently converted to EPIC, and so we have EPIC procedures, and we have EPIC op time, and our procedure base, especially radiology um, services, are in the procedure space. And so we currently are having challenges with getting that time, and I need to speak to the speaker from yesterday about getting that time out of workbench, because um, maybe it resides there. So um, the ability to um, encourage people to start on time has been a little bit challenged by that. What I would love to see in the future is for everything to be in op time and for the proceduralist to expect to um, have the same operational metrics in the NORA sites as they do in the operating room, which is not currently the case, except for our GI suite, which actually functions under perioperative services instead of, excuse me, under the other, um, under the other administrative hierarchical chain. So there are differences in, in the three areas listed here. So quality, what do we consider a real quality metric as opposed to operations and safety? Again, in my view, and this is just my opinion, this is about standardized processes across all areas of our practice. Um, these are the hospital quality metrics that are currently reported in the perioperative quality um, meeting. And, and for me, it's frustrating because a lot of it is vendor monitoring um, obviously, infection prevention and control and attire compliance. These are definitely important things, but I'm not exactly sure that they're anesthesia quality metrics. Um, but this is what the hospital sees our role as helping to enforce. Um, for me, what I would like to see in between NORA sites and perioperative sites, the same level of pre-op assessment and pre-op optimization uh, provided for the patients, same opportunities. Really, a history and physical needs to be completed in not just a checkbox manner by the proceduralist on the day of, of the procedure. MIPS metric apply. I don't know how many um, practices have you know, things like the smoking cessation metric. Um, do you meet them for your NORA areas for your pre-op assessment as you do in your surgical areas? Um, I can say that in our practice, the. MIPS metrics. Um, we're an ACO technically, so we don't 
independently report that, but in our uh, outlying hospitals that do report MIPS, um, I'm not so sure that those metrics are the same for the non-operating room space. Obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this gets to be a big issue in NORA sites, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Risk stratification. Do we have the same MPO criteria? Um, same PACU discharge criteria. This is something else I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. And do we have the same post-operative uh, anesthesia assessments in each area? This is where I would like to see our quality metrics be united on some of these fronts. Um, so when is a PACU not a PACU? Post-anesthesia care unit. When it's a NORA recovery room. Um, so these are some things that were reported to me as quality events. Um, I'm not going to go through reading the whole thing, um, but I do want to emphasize this is a bronchoscopy case that, uh, you know, didn't go uh, so well. Um, patient was reintubated and then had no place to go. Uh, the ICU didn't apparently have a bed and the PACU didn't want to take the patient. And so they waited for an hour in the bronchoscopy suite before somebody made a space for them to go. And the reporter said, if this were a true operating room, it would not have been a huge concern, but in the Bronx suite, we don't have the supplies. So this gets back to do this higher level of care. And this was before Diana took over, so. <laughs> um, patient arrived from the EP lab, so this is getting back to this recovery space. Arrived, and this is from the floor, from the um, um, cardiac floor. Patient arrived from the EP lab, hypotensive with systolic blood pressure 60s to 80s, heart rate 40s to 50s, uh, accompanied by the cath lab RN. Patient placed in Trendelenburg position. How did the patient leave the cath lab? PACU. PACU. It's not PACU. It's a recovery space. Um, it's a very good question, right? Why should a patient be arriving on the floor in this, in this condition? Um, and this, you know, led me several years ago, we had some battles over, and I heard this yesterday um, in talking to people, when somebody asked the question, if you had propofol in our IR suite years ago, you could not go to the radiology space recovery area because it was propofol. If you had, you know, 10 of midazolam and, you know, 200 mics of fentanyl, you could go there, but not if you had a little bit of propofol and were fully recovered. And, and that was really the level of comfort with the nurses. And that's been resolved um, in that particular recovery space. Um, but there is this organization, and I'm sure there are others, that actually certify perianesthesia nurses. So maybe a quality metric that we should be demanding of our institutions is that any place that we give an anesthesia, an anesthetic, or a deep sedation, um, that they have certified perianesthesia nurses, or at least nurses that have additional training and are comfortable with receiving patients who have had general anesthesia by any variety. These are our anesthesia recovery criteria. They're embedded into our EPIC. We need to make sure that these recovery criteria are adhered to um, in all areas where we care for patients. It's another quality metric that I'm sure we could um, measure out of the EPIC system or whatever your other um, uh, e EMR is. So uh, clearly this patient that left the uh, cath lab recovery area did not meet these criteria when they left. Um, and what are the hours? This is another um, report sent into our reporting system. And so they had uh, very concerns that patient from EP needed to go to the PACU based on anesthesia criteria and discretion of the anesthesia attending. And um, there was a back, big back and forth between the PACU and the um, recovery area for EP. Why did the patient really need to go to the PACU? There's only one nurse in EP recovery, and EP recovery closes at 6 p.m. or whatever the hour was, and they were approaching that hour. Now, getting back to your lecture just now, what is MAC? Um, and one of the things that when you look back on some of the data, um, let me just go back one. No, we'll stay here. Uh, some of the data that people have reported about, you know, increased um, adverse events in NORA sites, increased uh, respiratory events especially, that was well documented yesterday. Um, a lot of those patients had MAC anesthesia, but what is MAC anesthesia? This recently became a controversy in our institution, in New York Presbyterian, because of something that is similar to what was, uh, what I have on the slide, which is Empire, and I forget which 
This is uh, Carolina, I think North Carolina, but it's similar in other states, are now saying that it is not medically necessary for an anesthesiologist to administer any kind of sedation to anyone who does not meet the criteria um, on this list and that it was not reimbursable um, if it's a MAC case, monitored anesthesia care, medically necessary. Um, and so if it's not found to be medically necessary, it's not reimbursed. And we had some problems with the entire episode of care not being paid for because of this. Um, so we had to decide what's general anesthesia and what's monitored anesthesia care. And so we went back to the ASA standards and it says, obviously, if the patient loses consciousness and the ability to respond purposefully, the anesthesia care is a general anesthetic, irrespective of whether airway instrumentation is required. So we changed our documentation standards that if this happened to occur during the procedure, that it was to be called a general anesthetic. And we have these choices here as to what to call it. It's not to be, the MAC box is not to be checked off. And when you think about it, it's really true. It's not that we're just um, you know, saying this for the purposes of billing, although that is convenient. Um, but what do the patients think? The patients think they're getting sedation, but in reality, they're almost always, at some point during a lot of these procedures, getting a general anesthetic. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody. It certainly doesn't apply to cataracts or you know, many patients. But this is a study done by my colleague, Dr. Priscilla Nelson. Um, and presented at the IARS a couple of years ago, in 2021, where she used a Massimo and uh, she um, analyzed the um, Massimo tracings of uh, 50 patients undergoing various types of MAC, um, both in some in the OR, 40% uh, 40 of, 40 of them were outside the OR, and you can see that many of them uh, spent a good bit of time in a general anesthetic state. And so um, how does this impact us? If we're going to call uh, you know, most, say, endo upper endoscopies G uh, general anesthetics, how does this impact our operations? How does it impact our, our metrics in terms of assessing whether or not a complicating event occurred during a MAC anesthetic or a general anesthetic has implications for our metrics? Um, but the first, the first problem that we identified was that we have an OSA policy where if an OSA patient undergoes a general anesthetic, they have to stay for three hours. So, you know, the week that we implemented this, you know, this is a general anesthetic, then, you know, post-operative nursing was like, oh, well, the patient has to stay for three hours, even though they were completely recovered from their dose of propofol. So there is uh, part B on this, if considered uh, sufficiently recovered and safe to be discharged, they can be discharged uh, by the PACU attending. Um, but, you know, this is sort of an unintended uh, consequence, something we have to think about, our policies and procedures. Um, so safety, moving on to safety, which is, and you know, I think you'll see, you know, the original slide was a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap of all these things and maybe my definition of what fits into quality and what fits into safety isn't exactly your definition, but this is something that I think um, we ought to address and discuss. So for me, the safety is really the standardized metrics. And so, you know, there are national trends, as was described yesterday, um, morbidity, mortality, system safety, and non room uh, anesthesia. This is why we're here, right? We're all here to improve patient safety in this space, whatever we decide the scope of the space is. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important in, in terms of and this, you, you could consider this operational um, as well, but what kind of support do we have to ensure patient safety when we are um, in non-operating room areas. So this is something that I found uh, years ago. Um, when we're building new rooms, we always try to put, you know, in, in addition to the anesthesia machine, the space and the, a chair to sit on, you know, the amount of support services that we need. And that includes anesthesia technicians. And so I don't know if you are all aware, they have a society and they have recommendations for their coverage ratios. So MRI offsite uh, places should have one tech per area. So I don't know who has that. We don't have it yet. Um, we have one tech for all of the NORA areas. They will run around like chicken with their head cut off the whole day. 
um, assisting us, but it is important for safety that if you need a fiber optic, someone can bring it to you. If you are having a problem with your machine, someone can respond quickly who can help you address that. Um, and so this is, a, this is a safe, to me it's a safety metric. Um, do you have this ratio in your institution? Um, and how do we handle complications and adverse events? So the criteria for what is a significant event should be the same everywhere. The criteria, and I think that the use of um, you know, the EPIC automated data to find the unreported metrics is very important because you know, when you're offsite and something happens, you know, you're so busy dealing with it that sometimes you don't actually remember to report it. Um, and unlike if you're working next to me in an operating room or down, you know, down the same corridor, I might be aware of a kerfuffle a few rooms down. I might not know that it happened at all in an ORA site if I'm not there. Um, and I think we need to really look at outcomes. And these are the outcomes that I see. You know, these are just some of the outcomes. Uh, and one of the things that's not here, um, you know, DVT prophylaxis was mentioned yesterday in ORA sites that's sorely lacking. Um, database review, percentage of cases, what percentage of MAC cases are, are really general, how's our temperature management, infection control practices, all these things, are they the same? Can we measure, um, can we get real data on these important outcomes um, from our EHR or from our reports? Um, this is our comparative data from a couple of years ago, and so obviously we want our metrics to be the same. Um, and not to have any uh, outliers. I picked the good year <laughs> to show you. Um, and then we also have one thing that I was thinking about specifically in preparing for this meeting and uh, uh, the need to collaborate with others. We already have a responsibility for beta blockers in the STS uh, cabbage um, metrics. Um, should we be contributing or should we be looking at and getting data back from our NORA colleagues on things. All these metrics that I mentioned, should we be following them also and for our work in NORA sites? These are sort of the ones that we always look at for perioperative. Um, so if we're going to look at things for our colleagues in the perioperative, in the NORA spaces, what are some of those? Stroke metric is one, right? Um, one of the uh, articles that I, I found in preparing for this said, you know, the current definitions of uh, GA and MAC are heterogeneous. This is a, a paper trying to distinguish whether general or MAC is better for uh, someone coming for an embolectomy. And even the, in the you know, uh, neurology literature, they're like, well, the MAC and the general are very confusing. But one metric is a door to recanalization, door to skin puncture. These are our times, right? Door to skin puncture is pretty much our time. We own that time. And what can we do to make that as short as possible to contribute to a better outcome for the stroke metrics and collaborate? Uh, similarly, GI metrics, this was mentioned yesterday, the adenoma detection rate is, has been identified as the single most important quality measure in colonoscopy. Um, and so there's a whole GI literature about whether or not you should have conscious sedation, moderate sedation, who should be giving the propofol, et cetera, et cetera. Should we be using propofol? Is the rate of complication worse or better with propofol? Um, there's arguments and, and data to support either, either position. But this said, the, the failure of con conscious sedation is uncommon, occurring in less than one in four colonoscopies. Well, it was 22% in the study, and I didn't think that was uncommon. Um, but the risks of failing conscious sedation are female gender, trainee involvement, younger age, and the need for adjunctive medications. So maybe these criteria in our pre-op assessment or our involvement in the pre-op assessment for each uh, area would identify people who really do need our, our services and uh, decrease this failure rate. Um, and so sedation improved in this study, sedation improved uh, it doesn't look like much, but it's statistically significant, both the adenoma detection rate and the time uh, to get to the cecum. So um, this study supported, and the, and the propofol was extremely, um, extremely uh, well controlled in this study. This, this was the protocol. Um, and so future directions. Another area is patient-centered data. I was fascinated by what you said about getting uh, what looked like Prescani data organized or patient experience data organized. 
Um, the patient experience is not about making the patients happy over quality. It's about safe care first, high quality care, and then satisfaction. But we really don't have great patient-centered data, at least in my practice, to really help us know what their real outcome is. I mean, we don't even know if they had nausea and vomiting when they go home after an IR procedure. Um, we just don't get that information in a, in a usable fashion, and that's something else I'd like to see. So what are NORA appropriate metrics? Um, again, it's a Venn diagram. I think we can have discussions about what goes into which circle, but there's definitely a lot of overlap. I think we need to define shared metrics with our colleagues and coordinate together to make sure that our patient outcomes are the best that they can be. Um, and I would really like to see us engage more with patients and somehow get their optimization done preoperatively um, as much as possible in collaboration with the proceduralists, as well as get some patient recorded outcomes. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak to you. The um, most important session we're gonna have is from 10.30 to 11, so I wanna try and get back on time because I know people will be leaving uh, to catch uh, flights. So maybe we'll spend 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A session, then go into our breakout session, and we might shave a little bit of time off our break, so we'll start that last session promptly at 10.30. Uh, 15 minutes for your Q&A, any questions? Yeah, just just come on up, come on up to the mic. I'll stand in the middle. Just a quick question for Dr. Fogarty Mac. Um, when you switched over to GA, um, how upset were the patients for getting a GA bill? Um, so the patients who are getting GA, it is a problem um, because they're told they're getting sedation. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, we made this switch. It's not um, been uh, fabulously sustained. Um, and I think once we get a bigger penetrance on the insurers, um, and not just Empire that are denying this, it will become sustained. But, yeah, I mean, it has to start in the office of the proceduralist to say, you know, and, and we also have an obligation, we, we talk to them pre-op, and you know, my tactic would be, you know, this is um, sedation, but there will be times when you will be deep, you know, you will be sedated enough that it will actually technically be general anesthesia, so you may see that on your chart. But it's the same as what you got three years ago. It's just we're defining it differently now. And they're usually fine with it, but uh, you know, some people are like, no, I don't want general. And some people, you know, most people who are coming for sedation, especially in GI, like they want to be asleep. Like that's what they want. It, they don't want, you know, to be in and out on a lot of these procedures, you know. So. Uh, just a, a question on the AI. Uh, are there any certifying bodies or entities that look at the um, product that's being um, used uh, to determine outcomes is kind of a black box for most of us. Is there a third party that looks at them and says, yes, this meets certain standards? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. And uh, as I showed, there are FDA-approved algorithms, and for different places, there are different regulatory bodies that look through that. But again, some of those regulatory standards have minimal benchmarks, right? So you have to be cautious about that. And that's where the buck stops with us. And that's why I try to encourage that we need to get engaged and we need to be the, the key stakeholders in this. Just because somebody approved it, you know, it may not work well later on either, just like we're finding out about other devices. So yes, there are certifying bodies that are approved. There are government agencies that approve this, but still it's incumbent upon us to ask these important questions, not only after one approval, but, but also as we use them. And as, we, as AI algorithms get more traction in healthcare space, we are learning a lot more about implementation challenges. And that's where we need to work with the industry, we need to work with other partners to improve upon them. And that, that's the, the request that I have for engagement. 
Yeah, and I, I fully agree. I think it's and also, um, you know, these standards are actually being developed as, as we are understanding more of those. And FDA is actually actively partnering with groups and companies that are developing these uh, technologies. Um, so I, I fully agree. Monty, you knew I had to come up. So, no, I totally appreciate the, uh, the seditionist position, and I don't think it, that it is. It's really important that patients receive the kind of care necessary to maintain that patent airway. My question is, as a registered nurse, of course, um, could I become a physician assistant sedationist eventually? Uh, 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 all, uh, the doors are open to everybody. Okay. It's all about the patient and it's all about doing the right thing by the patient. And there are people who choose to move between the different professional opportunities that are there, and there should be no barriers to that. There are the obvious barriers, if you said to me, but there should be no barriers about that about that relates to background. Well, if you well and of course, in my heart, I hope that someday you consider a nurse anesthetist. <laughs> well, we'd love to have nurse anesthetists, but we've made the very difficult decision that if we, we don't have enough nurses, we've got an even bigger shortfall of nurses. So if they're very, very welcome, but we're, we're trying really hard not to over-encourage them because we don't have enough nurses. And that's a very difficult thing to say, but a number of the people who've turned up so far are actually nurses, and they're very welcome. Yeah. Just want to make a quick comment. If, if you don't, the robots are coming. <laughs> <laughs> this was the conversation that Piyush and I were having while uh, Monty was talking about that. I said, hey, we ignored the robots. <laughs> I've got two questions. First for Aman, in the outcome data you showed for RPM, um, it didn't reflect what I'm most interested in RPM um, for as a patient. I want to stay away from medical errors in the hospital, and I want to stay away from nosocomial infection. So is there any outcome data related to those things? And second question for Payush, is AI going to help us identify those patients that should be cared for in different types of of settings is it will it help us identify who's appropriate for an office and main OR, etc. Thank you. Yes, uh, great questions, both of them, and I think um, um, certainly we've seen uh, with the um, over the last ten years as the data outcome data has been collected in this particular space that complication rates outcomes have improved for the patients. Um, uh, so, so I would say that that's definitely the case, and patients actually do appreciate being treated at home if they know they're getting the same level of care uh, as they would in the hospital. So that's definitely also true. And I'll, I'll uh, wait to hear uh, Piyush's comment. Um, there's certainly, as the data are being collected on this space, um, many of these groups that are building these software applications, they're actually using AI and machine learning to guide which would be the right patient um, uh, to be in a hospital's care, care for a certain clinical condition in a hospital setting or a low acuity care or in a, in a home setting. So that's certainly happening now. Uh, still a close partnership between the clinician and the AI alg algorithms at this time, uh, which is probably healthy, um, but certainly that field is also developing. Yeah, uh, again, I just want to bust this myth. A AI, we are not there where AI is doing everything by itself. It's not Jarvis yet. If you want to check out some of the Jarvis uh, things, I can show you, but it's not there where it will do by itself. So to be clear, some of us have to write that software for AI to do something. Can it do that? Does the technology exist? Yes. Does the data exist? Maybe, maybe not. So that's why the importance of data capture, you know, just like Dr. Wanderer was saying yesterday, the, the tools and the technology exist, so it's incumbent upon us to pose those questions and develop the solutions. The technology exists. Uh, thank you for your lectures. Um, uh, a question for Payush. When you, you gave the date on cardiac arrest and then the hypotension uh, for 15 minutes, have you implemented sort of a best pa practice alert system uh, within in that computer algorithm, and then if so, have the outcomes changed? And what is the clinician's response potentially to those best practice or alerts? Because we get a ton of alerts, right? So I, I guess I would ask, what has been the outcome of that data? Has it dr driven 
uh, practitioner change? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. But I'll go back to what I'd said. Uh, we made a switch in our EHR to Epic uh, in the last few months. So the data that you see is from that. And right now, I want it to run so that I can validate that data first. As we have the team that is set up to look at the data, analyze it meaningfully, and see what change we need to make where. But the most important thing is make sure you validate that data first. Because just because it's giving me these numbers doesn't mean it's true, right? And the numbers that I showed you, I val we validated those. Those are real numbers. We, we have all the incidents and cases. It's really impressive that somebody doesn't need to put it as an event of cardiac arrest. Even if you give one, one milligram of epi or you put in some, some uh, comment over there, we can do a string search and pull it off that the patient had cardiac arrest. So we can do all that stuff, but that needs to be validated before you implement a change. I, I think you make a really great comment. I was talking to John last yesterday. We have Slicer Dicer at our, at our institution, and one of our, AI, our computer uh, uh, providers put out this data saying uh, the highest to lowest redose rates for labor epidurals. Turns out that mine was like in the top three of all the highest redose rates. I was kind of like, well, my epidural's not working. Nobody really thought about validating this. Yeah. So I went back and actually talked to the nurses. Turns out they prefer to call a handful of, of providers at night more than other because of the responses that they get. So my, my actual redose rate, I believe, was because I, I was easy enough to wake up no matter what time of night. So, so I, I think it's really important what you said Somebody behind the scenes before administrators get involved that don't have a lot of wherewithal to understand this data that's coming out from AI and large databases really to synthesize the information, really look very specifically on how it's being collected, and then translate it. Because a lot of folks in, in, uh, outside of clinical medicine don't understand some of the stuff that we're doing. Yeah, the, so, the last thing I want to you, build is you. another BPA that fires up. That's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a great example of no good deed goes unpunished, huh? Uh, the British Health Service, we just saw, is doing an analysis of its requirement for anesthesia providers um, in the not very distant future, which shows profound shortages of anesthesia providers and plans being developed for how you meet that problem. Facetiously, you said the robots are coming. And the answer, and so the question that I have for you is, when? So at what point um, are robots part of an answer to a shortage of anesthesia providers? And, and beyond um, when, in what way will they be able to uh, help us with that shortage? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. I wish I knew. I would invest in the stock market based on that. Uh, and again, when we think about robots, you, I don't mean like that transformer robot or you know the Iron Man robot or something. Uh, I think there are robotic uh, uh, devices that are already in place in healthcare in many different ways and fashions and forms. And I showed one example, that was a Nature publication uh, where I showed like how they developed this robot that can help, help you get IV access. So it might start with something as simple as that. And it may not be applicable for all the patients. It may be more applicable for a group of patients where you are spending 45 minutes trying to get IV access. You know, they, it might help in that situation. So what fashion these robots will come in uh, what form they will take place, how they will help us. I think it's more, more up to us to, to understand and develop or co-develop with our engineers because we are the ones who have to define those needs. I mean, there are uh, airway intubation robots you know, that are coming, but are they something that you will see everywhere? I don't know. I think that's where we have to have a scientific approach to this and stay away from the hype. Uh, I'll give you uh, this statement. Jeff Hinton, who is the father of deep learning uh, out of Canada, uh, many years ago, I think it was 2016 or so, he said, you should stop having uh, radiology training programs because AI will take over. 
So you won't need radiologists. That's the statement he made. He made. I think that was a misunderstanding on his part because what I have actually recently presented is since he made the statement, the number of radiology programs have increased. And my friend who's a radiologist said he just has had his pay doubled up because they are so short. So AI is there, it is helping them, but it is actually augmenting them. It's, it's not artificial. You know, it's more augmentation. It's where it is going to help you. The same way the robots are going to help you in some things, but we have to be mindful where. We have to guide that. And, and that's where I think it's very difficult to predict when or, or uh, where they will help us. Thank you. So uh, we're going to finish uh, promptly at uh, 9.15 and then go to your breakout groups. Uh, I'll ask, Dr. Ehrman has a uh, question, but I'll ask a rhetorical question. It doesn't require an answer. Uh, the whole purpose of this session was to get us thinking about where we should be five years from now to improve quality and safety. And I wonder how far away we are from a future where we had good predictive analytics uh, or AI uh, to say, Patient X should get procedure Y in site Z, so to speak, to match up that. Patient X has a 54% chance of uh, interoperative MI, so you're going to the hospital. And then to eliminate uh, low value care or to augment uh, good care with a future of the hospital at home with biosensors where there would be a central repository where we'd be monitoring seven or eight different uh, data sets or maybe 15 and we would notice a dip on day three for a certain data set and we would do an intervention uh, based on that. So, so that's kind of the future that I see uh, in medicine, but certainly for a lot of Nora type type procedures. So uh, if you want to make a comment, that's fine, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ehrman for the last. Uh... Uh, Dan and uh, Rich, I mean, that's definitely a very insightful observation and a question. Uh, I think actually the future is here today. It's just not uniformly or universally dispersed across all practices. And I think the, the bigger question, though, would be which of these practices, which, which are seemingly futuristic, but as I shared with you some data, they're actually in use in many of our practices today and in, 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 in many of the centers that are represented here. Which of these things will scale, scale up to be, become universally used practices? And I think that's where you know, we as a specialty and others need to develop the evidence that's needed to, to show that you know, those outcomes uh, are improved and they actually matter to the patients and they can actually reduce costs. I think doing things in small pilots, that's great, that's a start, but we don't move to the next st step of seeing if they can be scaled up as a universal solution. Um, and many of these technologies actually can today can be scaled up for the reasons that I mentioned before, because they become inexpensive, they become, they've actually democratized care, and given the aligned interest between the patients and the payers and the health system providers, I feel those are the technologies and solutions which will, are likely to get scaled up. So I would say the AI is here. It's in your echo device, it's in your ultrasound, it's in your GPS, it's in our quality safety program. We are analyzing our data using that. So the AI is here, the robots are coming. I want to thank you, first of all, for a wonderful panel. My question is based on a conversation I had with someone yesterday over lunch about patient triage tools. So, you know, in a lot of large academic places, there are as many non-OR cases. If you combine anesthesia and non-anesthesia cases, we do OR cases, right? So do you have, can you comment on incorporating decision support tools to help our, especially our non-anesthesia colleagues, triage patients appropriately? You know, when you think about preoperative evaluations and, you know, if you, the sheer volume of these cases, and a lot of them end up being non-anesthesia cases. But, you know, can you comment on sort of, you know, using your EHR and try to incorporate these decision tools so they can make decisions, you know, that are appropriate, you know, and, and do it safely? Um, you know, given that, you know, as we all know, patients are getting sicker and the volume just keeps going up and there's limited supply of anesthesia providers. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's a great place for implementation of some of these augmented intelligence tools. Uh, a lot of algorithm scores are already there, at least at our place, they are already embedded within our pre-operative evaluation. And then the next step for us is we are already working on uh, implementing the augmented intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning to power it up further. Uh, but a lot of those scores and algorithms are already there for us. Uh, and I guess for many other centers, they are there or they are coming. Uh, so let's uh, go straight to our breakout groups and let's uh, convene with the breakout groups until 9.45, come back here at 9.45. We'll plan on half an hour uh, for the report out. Uh, yesterday took quite a bit longer than what we had planned, but uh, we'll take a short break between 10.15 and 10.30 and then reconvene for the big uh, whammer jammer, so to speak, that uh, JW has planned at the end. Thank you.
break. Uh, we have limited time for the breakout sessions, so please convene in your uh, breakout uh, sessions. So, thank you.
So we're going to uh, reconvene in about two minutes uh, to, so we can get through our report out. So if you could kind of wind down your conversations. I know everybody didn't get through everything, so. Okay, thank you. Welcome back everyone. We're gonna start because we only have about 25 minutes to report out, not the luxury that we had yesterday. And perhaps I'll just take moderator's uh, privilege and start <laughs> since I had a group. I met with um, several um, folks, Anita and Aaron virtually. They've been with us um, online and we're so grateful and they've appreciated all that you've um, contributed. Wait, I gotta start my own timer. All right. I gotta make it smaller so I can see what I'm doing. Mm -mm -mm. So today we're starting with the staff and teamwork. Um, the virtual group today, um, we were looking at number three and number four and wondered if the uh, ACLS PALS certified should be separated from ongoing team quality improvement. I'm gonna have to go stop them, okay? All right, guys. Either I finish reporting out or you start. Which do you wanna do? <laughs> Since you're still talking, I might as well just let you start. Do you want, to, do you want, to, do you want this to key you? Up? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Three minutes. All right. Timer's on. Three minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, we had a very good discussion, and I'll go through this quickly. Um, for number one, let me just see. Okay. Just have to get oriented. It was more about the there we go. There we go. All right. So for number one, uh, we talked about the appropriate clinical leadership team instead of defining nursing, surgical, because in office-based locations, you may not have access to all of those individuals. Um, number two and three, we wanted to combine those to emphasize that there needs to be two people present with the ability to resuscitate a patient. Um, number four, we wanted to change the verbiage from available to accessible um, and shorten the list to crisis checklist and let that, um, so we can make it more concise. Um, six and seven, we were combining those two um, because we felt that um, number six really uh, made the statement that was necessary and we can just combine in the concept of number seven. All right, so then going on to preoperative care and patient selection, um, we uh, recommend combining one and two. Um, for the third one, we are moving to the equipment section. That's our recommendation. We felt that that was more appropriate there. Um, number four, this was a very long 
one. So we were recommending um, to add it to number one and include according to comorbidities. So shortening that a bit and just adding it to number one. Thank you. All right. Number five, the timeout should happen before anesthesia starts. Now we're going on, so we intraoperative care, we were happy with all of those. Now postoperative care, we had a few recommendations. Number two, um, we wanted to shorten this one to just state that the patient should be discharged home um, after they reach phase two criteria and just shorten the language there. Number three, we could combine with number two. Oh, there we go. And then dropping down to number six, um, we thought that could also be combined with number two. Um, number eight, this is where we started to run out of time. <laughs> but there was some debate that maybe we could remove this or maybe this, it, it was talking about opioids, so maybe it's in the pre-op assessment. Maybe we could note something there rather than it being here. And then number nine, replace adult with individual to make it more um, appropriate. Thank you very much. Any questions for us? Perfect timing. We don't have time for questions. You're out. All right. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Nice yeah. job. So should we go back to group number one? Who's reporting? Oh, our same friend. <laughs> You're our soft touch. All right. So uh, we were a little behind yesterday, and we didn't, we didn't get through everything either. So on our equipment, um, just in general, we talked a lot about, again, splitting out hospital versus non-hospital. Um, uh, on equipment section number one, we suggested changing anesthesia personnel to just personnel. Um, and then we talked a lot about uh, some of the other language around, you know, if you're using a pump, use a library. It's, we talked about keeping those not just specific to hospital, recognizing that some of these places may or may not have IV pumps. Same thing with volatile anesthetics and succinylcholine. Um, we suggested grouping 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 as hospital-based potentially. Um, then we talked about the 12 lead availability and clarified, you know, that as well. Uh, talked a lot about cardiologists and does it need to be a cardiologist reading a 12 lead or is the bigger purpose to, you know, see if you need to perform an additional contact other personnel. Um, then moving into staffing and teamwork, we talked about in each NORA location there should be adequate staff to support the patient anesthesia care team. Um, specifically, it stated an RN. We talked about some of these office locations and dental offices not having an RN. Uh, then we talked a little bit as well about the ACLS PALS and then talked about BLS versus ACLS in some of these areas where you may have other personnel. Recognizing, obviously, we'd love to have everyone have ACLS and PALS if appropriate, but also talked about the reality of that. Um, and then we talked about, in number four, the links to resources um, for the checklist. Uh, suggested putting links for some actual checklists and removing the very specific details of anesthesia airway and all the other ones that were listed there. And then um, the final sections were around um, talking about the director and Nora, clarifying that for, uh, it currently is listed as an anesthesiologist, clarifying that for those office-based locations and dental offices as well. And that's really as far as we got, unfortunately. Well done. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, Dan will get it. Group three? Uh oh. We're doing it in different orders here. Well, I want to go to three. Huh? Yeah. Okay. They are energized. All right. <laughs> All right. We, uh, we had, again, in, in the green room, it, it's an area of very spirited conversation. Um, in terms of. Uh, in, in, in one, we, uh, we wanted to replace uh, anesthesia with all stakeholders uh, in terms of team building. And um, we had a concern, you know, with the suggestion that um, too frequently uh, the team members, when we talk about team building, don't even know each other's names. And so we were looking for a way of facilitating 
at least that very minimum requirement that at least you know who's in the room with you. And um, most ORs in, in the experience of the folks that were in the room have whiteboards. Most Dendora locations don't. And so the concept of, of um, a whiteboard or some way of, of posting who the team members are, uh, we thought was a, a, a real advance on the way things are done now in terms of team building. So that was a suggestion that we, we thought we should make. Um, for two, uh, Rather than uh, describe who should be on the team, we, we wrote in each NORA location there shall be adequate staff in number and role to support, and I am taking some liberty here, uh, the patient and the anesthesia care team rather than the anesthesia care team and the patient. Um, and then we added throughout the perioperative process because we're concerned not just with what actually goes on in the NORA room, but that the patient when they leave anesthesia, that, some, that particular room, that there's still somebody there who, who is adequate to take care of that patient. And I think that's an important consideration. Certainly, we presented cases yesterday where, where that was a key to, to saving a life or could have saved a life. Um, to say we had controversy around three <laughs> um, is to understate the, the actual um, concern. And principally, the concern was around the age limit of uh, when we added, we, we called it pediatric locations and, you know, when is PALS appropriate. And I think in the end, we came away with, uh, with the idea that we would call them pediatric patients and sort of leave them, leave the, the decision as to how you define a pediatric patient um, to uh, a, a group that wasn't restricted to a 15-minute conversation, but uh, the different uh, arguments that were made were should it be puberty um, and since not everybody is going to be comfortable with Tanner staging and deciding you know whether they've reached puberty or not um, there were discussions regarding should we just make it an age um, and the age that was talked about was 12 but we we really didn't develop a consensus around it um, there is concern that uh, clearly the folks who are in the room should be competent to take care of the patients that are in front of them. And, by the, and that competence should include the ability to handle an emergency. And, uh, and the emergency, whether it be an ACLS emergency or a PLS emergency, I think there was consensus around that. Is that fair, guys? Is it, yeah. Yeah, we're, um, pro we're probably at time, and I think for the glossary, yeah. that'd be great. What are, do you have other highlights you could just give us the nuggets? Uh, I, I've got good news for you. Okay. That's as far as we got. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love the green room. <laughs> Yay. Oh, group four. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Um, so we didn't get uh, through too much. Uh, we also, I think we're having some issues with it. We, we all thought number one sounded like a great idea there. Uh, number two, when it came to the adequate staff uh, to support, um, we just talked about, you know, we're trying to apply these also to places where sedation's happening. So if we're, you, you don't want to just support the anesthesia personnel, we want to make sure that there's um, support for whoever the sedation provider is so that the only role they are responsible for is sedation and that there's adequate uh, staff in the room to support them. So whether that's a registered nurse, if there's a nurse doing the sedation, there needs to be another nurse to circulate, um, depending on the procedure, or if it's a GI and there's a tech, but just whoever the sedation provider, there's adequate support so that their only role is sedation or anesthesia and that there's adequate staff to do the other jobs. Um, as well for the number three, talking about again, um, if there's no anesthesiologist there or no uh, CRNA or anesthesia assistant, then saying the anesthesia personnel needs ACLS isn't really going to help anyone. So we thought it's better to just expand it to say two people involved on the site, uh, two people on site, BA ACLS. But then we also talked about um, in some situations, it may actually be more useful just to have one ACLS person and multiple BLS people. Because if you really have someone who knows what to do with the meds, what you need is people giving good, high-quality chest compressions. What you need is uh, 
people able to get you what you know the medications and things like that. So more focused on having more of the team involved in other ways than necessarily, you know, just having two people that know ACLS and no one who knows BLS might get you in a whole lot more trouble while you're waiting for help to come. Um, we also thought in that uh, number three that that second part of the sentence after the ACLS may not really belong there. Uh, maybe that should go, to, you know, that's more talking about quality initiatives. We thought that might be better to tie in um, down with number five, kind of number five um, seemed like a, maybe a little over directive about what should constitute a quality <laughs> improvement. So maybe get rid of number five and instead take that second sentence out of three. Um, and that quality improvement could include root cause analysis when, but also encouraging debriefs on the day of when, when things happen. Um, as, as more of a focus than having, you know, conferences, really just having those in the moment debriefs or the day of debriefs. Um, for number four, uh, instead of just crisis checklists, let's have crisis manuals, things that actually tell you what the next steps are, cognitive aids available. And we kind of thought just that first sentence was sufficient. They should be available. We don't need all the specifics about what those aids are for. Each location is going to need different crisis manuals depending on what's done there. So, and if you get a stack this big, people can't find the one they need when there's actually a crisis. So instead, let's, let's just say crisis manuals as cognitive aids are available and visible in every neural location, and then the team figures out which ones apply to their location. All right, we're at three minutes. Um, you got your last perfect. nuggets. Perfect. Uh, that was it. For number six and seven, we thought they should get combined together and maybe talk about dedicated liaisons instead of liaisons. So if you're in a place where there's many different sites, maybe they each have their own liaison, um, but that you're really thinking about a team appropriate to the site. I love synchronized thought across yeah. these groups today. It's been so. awesome. Thank you so much. And for anyone who doesn't know, our colleagues from the AORN are here who write these guidelines for that you just heard. So Lisa and Amber, thank you for your work and your team and for being here with us today. I know we got a lot of experts in the room. Yeah, thank you. All right, where's the group five? Five Alive. Hello? Okay. Since I'm impossible to shut up, I think the group just decided for efficiency's sake to make me present. <laughs> um, so the first thing, um, it, this may go back to equipment, and so I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, it may go back to equipment, but also patient selection to kind of bridge the gap. Um, it was, uh, there is number three in the patient selection and perioperative, or preoperative care. Um, number three says the patient size and weight capacity limit should be established for applicable equipment to confirm patient suitability for the site. Um, that also goes for supplies, so airways and things like that and, and masks. So, you know, again, if you're treating pediatric patients, um, do you have the right size supplies and equipment to resuscitate the patient? So that could go to equipment or it could go to patient selection because if you don't have them, you should be bringing the patient somewhere else. So that was the one that we sort of maybe went afield on, but uh, wanted to mention that. Um, getting to the beginning of staffing and teamwork, um, we talked about, again, when you list people out, it becomes difficult because then some folks don't see themselves listed and then decide that they don't have, that it doesn't apply to them. So with uh, number one, we considered things like all stakeholders or the entire care team uh, needs to be involved rather than listing them out individually. Um, there was a statement, there was a comment that number two seemed a little prescriptive. Personally, I'm okay with prescriptive, but we're, again, we're a standard setting body and we get a little bit he more heavy handed than you guys do, so, so take that for what it's worth. Um, I don't think we had an issue with number three as it is number four. Uh, again, we just got away from the listing, so we just went uh, with the checklists as opposed to listing out individual ones. We also talked a little bit, um, as, as the first group who presented it, about availability. Uh, because availability and access is really the most important piece because it's great if you have it, but if no one can get it in an, an emergency, that's a problem. Um, and so while that would both apply to printed and electronic versions, um, again, as a standard setting body, we've seen in, in, on, on surveys that the facility has everything electronic, uh, but when the emergency involves a power outage, it's really hard to access that, so having sort of contingency planning in place is pretty important. Um, <clears throat> 
The other part that I think we talked about a little bit more was numbers six and seven, um, and that these are kind of hospital type uh, settings that would have this kind of type of infrastructure in place. Um, and so if we went back, go back to the conversation of yesterday about how big we go and who's targeted here, um, the question is, um, does this become something that is targeted to the hospital NORAs or the larger NORAs that have a director? Because if you go to the uh, solo practitioner um, office surgery settings or some of the clinics or some of the suites, you may have contract anesthesia, anesthesia so you don't have a director of anesthesia and things like that. So it's something to consider, but uh, part and parcel with that is if you're going to sort of matrix things, what's the what's the other version? Is there another version that should be written for the offices yeah. um, to integrate anesthesia? Because when you're just bringing in contract anesthesia, often they're an afterthought, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So we want to speak directly to that as well. So three-minute nugget announcement. Last one. OK. Um, we also added a number eight that the anesthesia and proceduralists have uh, concordant uh, care plans. That's really important in our standards, oh. and we talked about it a little bit in our group. Oh, sorry. I did have one more. The, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> for preoperative care and patient selection, number four, our group uh, talked about cleaving out sort of the middle section and making that a separate bullet aside from BMI, and then sort of concatenating the first and, and last sentences for number to retain as number four, and then those other factors bringing out in another in another bullet, and then the final point was that throughout the entire guidelines. Um, they should be listed, all the guidelines should be listed in descending order of importance, so you can focus on one before you move on down. Well, we're still buying into your visual ideas of the matrix from <laughs> yesterday, so you sold that, Tom. Thank you very much. From the online group, I'm not sure we had a whole lot different than all of you brought forward. When we were looking at the staff and teamwork, um, that that conference piece really kind of brought some conversation and really looking at cross-functional multidisciplinary interdisciplinary team versus interprofessional so how can we bring um, representatives from different areas together to have that conversation um, so we were suggesting combined seven and eight when we looked at the peri the preoperative care and the patient selection it seemed like it was much like policy considerations um, so how could we hone in on those and make it very clear because they are standards, they're, they're standards, they're guidelines, they're things that already exist. Um, and then we totally agree with everyone talking about the OSA and the patient size and the weight capacity and all that. Those are individual co um, com considerations, one for facility, one for the patient, but how do we combine that in really a um, comprehensive policy kind of position to um, look at? And then, oh, looking at number six in that section as well about the um, procedure type inexperienced staff, we were thinking about um, really creating, um, there is a formal and informal plan for team training um, related to new or modified procedures as well as orientation or proctoring as necessary. So that was where we stopped. And with that, we will thank you for your breakout work and all that you have gifted us with. We're going to take a 10-minute just stretch break. If we're all that has, haven't had their coffee, tea, their snack, go get that and come on back, and we're going to wrap it up. 10.30. 10.30. All right. 10.30. Overruled.
Hey, everybody. Can we get uh, back to attention, please? Just because we are going to run short on time for sure. I just learned this last week. If you're listening, turn to your left and go shh. Turn to your right and go shh. I also l heard someone's purpose last week or two weeks ago expressed as life begins when your comfort zone ends. And we have officially exited my comfort zone. So this is going to be an exciting hour. Um, and I have some notes which I forgot to bring up. I'll just start by reassuring you that these recommendations are not final. This is just one part of the process. And we all recognize that you had a massive amount of information to go through and not enough time. But nonetheless, I think we can have a very productive final hour of our conference today. First, let's thank our moderators for getting us through the breakouts. And I'll, thank you for all of your efforts as well. Um, in terms of our process from here, so we've gone through a couple revisions of the recommendations. We've put these recommendations now through breakouts. We've, I've been revising the recommendations you know, with other people's inputs kind of on a nightly basis. But there was no time to revise anything from this morning. So the recommendations that were in place on the PDF yesterday are going to be shown on slides here later. We're going to go through, we're going to use a polling application. Has everyone been able to download Poll Everywhere or join via the QR code or go through the URL? Anybody, um, if anybody has trouble with that, uh, the board of directors successfully did it two days ago, and they are super users. And they will be available to help you guys. First, I'd just like to uh, mention what our schedule is going to be th for the remainder of the day. This particular part of our program is going to finish at 11.25. Dan's going to close us out from 11.25 to 11.30. We respect everyone's time, and uh, we are aware there's a bus coming at 11.45. That bus will also arrive at 11.30, and we will be on time for that. In terms of what I'm going to do today with you all, we're going to review these recommendations one by one. It's going to be an awkward voting format. Awkward is meaning there's probably going to be some silences. It may feel like a bit of a test. I don't think it's um, a good use of, of our efforts for me to read each one. So I think they're just going to be presented. And we're going to ask you if you agree or disagree with it. Please consider these conceptually not for the exact verbiage that's going to be shown on the screen. So really think of it as, is, is this concept or is this subject relevant or important to be included in NORA recommendations? <clears throat> that's how I want you to approach it, um, recognizing that later in the fall, there's going to be a an additional draft that you all are going to see to have, um, to have the opportunity to redline. And there's going to be further revisions after that before this is final. OK, does everybody have the application going? Does everyone see a map? OK, I think we'll probably see some initial results from <clears throat> our map. If anyone has not voted on the map, go ahead and vote. This is where your vacation, favorite vacation spot is. What was that? So if you hold it too long, it says in there. Is that what it was? All right, so we got people that are able to start interacting with it. And we're going to go on to the next one. And these are just some practices to see, just to make sure everybody's kind of up and running with the application. Error. Did I tell you I was about to get out of my comfort zone? 
I wonder if it's, it shouldn't be too many people, Stacy. This is exciting stuff. What we're actually going to be doing is more of multiple choice and true false. Let's see if those work. And that's not registering either. This is interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure what the delay's for, yeah, but we'll, we will learn to live with this and go on with it. Here we got 30, we're going up. We had a total of 70 people in a room initially. Is anyone still getting errors? Well, we're going to push on here. Here's a true false. <laughs> we got some optimists in the audience. Can everyone who's voted here just raise your hand? I want to see a, I don't know if that looks like 30 or more than 30 if all the votes are not being captured. Still errors down there? I'm going to rejoin through my app and see what happens. Well, this is unexpected, but we're going to go with it. Our next one also not working. Um, give me one moment, everybody. My apologies. Uh, can everybody try voting again? Still same thing? Okay. So we're going to 
go old school and just do a show of hands on some of these things. Unless uh, anyone on the planning committee have any other suggestions for just kind of trying to record consensus in a room other than the show of hands at this point? I just did that. Anyone who's joined via laptop or via the URL having problems, or is it just people with the app? Laptop also? OK. OK, so let's abandon ship on poll everywhere. And let's, um, what's that? Yes, we are, that's how we're, we're going to go through there. Um, Elizabeth, can you kind of help me record the hands? OK. We're going to go right into it. This is going to be point by point through all the recommendations we've reviewed over the last two days. Do you want to also take notes, Patty, with, um, oh, let's have Elizabeth take notes, yeah. And if, you have, if anyone has any comments, yeah, go with the mic. What's that? Interesting. <laughs> oh. Yes, I would, if, if you're stuck on a previous question, reload the, reopen the application. I'm getting an error again. Yep, we're doing hands. OK. Um, scope has been broken into two pieces and revised on yesterday's, uh, based upon yesterday's feedback. Here's part one of the scope. This is uh, locations included in scope. Show of hands in favor. OK, we're going to go on to the next one. This is. Personnel considered to be in scope. Show of hands in favor. All right, thank you. And anyone at any time can interrupt here. Facility one, again, we're looking at concepts, principles, et cetera. In favor? Thank you. Facility two, again, hands up if in favor. Hey, JW, there's a suggestion to not in favor, just so we catch or capture that, people who are not in favor. Thank you. Yes, sure. we, we'll begin doing that. Do we want to go all the way back to the beginning? And also, those of us that are thinking need you to slow down just ever so slightly. OK, you all got right. it. Um, anyone not in favor here? Three. Anyone who's not in favor is welcome to stand up and have a quick um, summary, or we can pass on it. I'll just let you all step to the microphone if you need to. I just don't understand the exclusion of ASCs because there's still NORAs at ASCs, right? I, that was the one part I got confused on yesterday. That's a good point. The NORA locations at ASCs should be included. I was thinking purely of operating rooms in those locations. OK. Uh, the scope of practice is totally different between in-hospital versus out-of-hospital units. Even those IR in-hospital or an outpatient unit, they're totally different. They don't do the same thing, same procedure, same patients, different. So. It's very hard to uh, mix them both together. Understood. Thank you. OK, number two. Anyone uh, not in favor here that would like to provide rationale? Please. Procedure sedation, totally different than anesthesia services. Those are two different animals, two different sets of providers, two different sets of uh, guidelines and practices and medications and so forth. So uh, I would say totally different. We should not 
mix them together in one uh, in one recommendation or one uh, set of uh, advisory panel. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments there? Okay, we're just going to start with the in favor again on this one, which we just uh, started a moment ago. I'm asking everyone just to kind of revote real quick. Okay. Anybody not in favor on this one? All right, number two, in favor? Anyone not in favor? Number three, in favor? Anyone not in favor? Thank you. Four, some wording change here. Active was removed because it's a source of persistent confusion. Anyone not in favor here? Electrical outlets and backup power supply. Anyone not in favor? Lighting and backup lighting? Anyone not in favor? Space, we added uh, clearance. The wording's not great here, but we added clearance yesterday um, after hearing that um, one account of an anesthesiologist being hit in the head with a C arm. Thank you. Anyone not in favor here? It's a great point. Did, you, did everybody hear that? Here, do you want to hear? Sure. Sorry. Um, we talked about the ability to get emergency equipment in the room, code carts and the like, um, as a as a good addition to this uh, recommendation. Thank you. The uh, recommendation related to continuous suction, dedicated for the anesthesia team. Anyone opposed? Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Okay. On, on that previous one, I think, didn't we say with backup, the suction backup? Um, no, it was, um, yeah, I think we, we indicated basically that there needed to be a dedicated source of suction for the anesthesia personnel right. that would be separate from the surgical suction, so not necessarily a backup. Okay. Any more questions on that one? This one was added last night, so we've not had the opportunity to discuss it. Anyone in favor or opposed, or how about in favor right now based upon this one-liner? How about opposed? Can I just get some comments from, from uh, Megan and Fred in this table here, please? Here you go, here you go. Does it need to be dedicated if it's in an area where you're also doing sedation? Is there any reason why they can't be? And if it's in an office, I mean, you may not have a recover. Sometimes you recover them in the same room you did the procedure. Just, yeah. a, just a space, a dedicated recovery yep. area that has appropriate monitors and personnel for the patient. <laughs> I mean, it does not need to be a separate space is what yeah, I'm Yeah, it doesn't need you. to be a physically yep. separate space, but wherever the patient is recovered, they need to have the right equipment and personnel to do that. Okay. Go ahead, Fred. I think the, an easy way to do that would just be to change the word room to area. Okay. Simple. A lot of the issues we hear in the dental offices, um, those problems come because they just leave the kid with the parent or yep. just get back to doing something. They're not on monitors or they're only on a pulse ox monitor um, and they don't have personnel or equipment available 
to meet the ASA standards for recovery. Okay. Thank you both. Oh, yeah. There's one here. Just going to echo what she said earlier. Um, so it should be appropriately equipped with monitors and staffing. And then the other thing is that it should be include a pre-anesthesia assessment area. JW. Thank you. You, yes. may, you may want to clarify, say, for NORA area between parentheses S, so in case two NORA areas close together, they can have, but, but make sure that to, to uh, specify that this PACU is for NORA. Because right now we already have dedicated post and seizure recovery room in every hospital, but that's for the OR. We're talking about NORA, I want to clarify that. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Any other comments on this new item? Oh. Yeah, kind of similar to those comments. Um, I just wonder about the word dedicated. Um, in some hospitals, the NORA locations are actually very close to the OR. For example, my institution, we use the same PACU for both NORA and um, OR cases and with the same standards for both. Um, so I just wonder about the word dedicated. Okay, thank you. So to, to kind of handle all that, you know, we just say and sort of you, there must be an identified recovery area, but I also think the area is only as important as the equipment and the staffing as well. Just to talk about some of those dental issues that certainly the monitoring equipment has something to do with it, but also when you have contract anesthesia particularly and people don't want to pay them to stick around, that's when the anesthesiologist leaves and that's when you know a problem happens yep. or something like that. So I think broadening that a little bit could be helpful. And again, in our standard, we allow the way we, I forget the exact wording, but we allow them to recover where they treated the patient as well. Um, just obviously as long as they're not like starting to turn that this, this space over for the next patient. So it's just about like identification rather than kind of segregation. Great points. Thank you, everybody. Moving on. Oh, sorry, did we vote on this? Given the suggested wording changes that focus on ensuring the patient has proper monitoring and proper staffing wherever that happens, are people in favor of adding this plus, adica plus adding a comment about a pre-op, pre a location to pre-op that patient? In favor? Opposed? Okay, we're on to equipment. In favor on this item? Anyone opposed? Thank you. One of the great things about Poll Everywhere, had it worked, is it provides anonymity. So I'm sorry that we're asking everyone to raise your hands in this group, but please be cognizant that we expect, we respect all dissenting opinions. They're extremely important, so please speak your mind. Equipment number two. This was modified, and um, this should have been modified. It said it should say when inhalational anesthetics. Nope, sorry, that was a different one. This one is properly worded. I'll give you a moment. In favor? Anyone opposed? Thank you. This was updated yesterday. LMA was replaced with supraglottic airway. In favor? Opposed? JW, this is Lynn. My only question is, should that, are those examples or are those required? So is it IE or EG? Because there are Ex other things you could have. Yeah, just examples. Okay. Thank you, Len. Sure. Equipment number four, in favor? Opposed? Thank you. And just to reiterate, please interrupt at any time. Number five, seems like a reasonable one. In favor? Opposed? Thank you. I'm sorry? Should we add age? 
for the, for the equipment number five? Equipment. Yeah, this came up in one of the at least one of the groups today, yeah. which which does have to do with supplies. Okay. Adequate for the patient population, including ages, expected at that location. So yes, I would want if children to be cared for in a location, we'd want to have resuscitation uh, equipment for them as well. And we just, um, do we vote on this one already? You guys gotta help me here. Okay, um, equipment number six. Oh, I think we like to see the, uh, the affirmative <clears throat> hand up too, but thank you for trying to make my life easier. Um, okay, thank you. Anyone opposed? Please. I mean, I carry enough carts. I don't need to carry an extra cart. But I do have an emergency airway case. Um, so I think emergency that's a, supplies. That's a great point about the importance of language. Could we just add um, to, I don't know, to support ACLS rescue if needed? Because if you start sort of every little item, you're going to... Can you not say that as a clarifier, maybe? That would simplify it. Yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, thank you for that point. I was just curious what people oh, thought about it. AIDs. Say again? Uh, automatic defibrillators versus manual defibrillators. You, there's a lot of things you can't do with an AID, including some of the ACLS protocols. Yeah. I had not considered AED versus uh, a defibrillator, per se. Do you note that? So we can, yeah. Thank you for raising that. Great discussion. Thank you for raising these points. Uh, there was a comment yesterday about should we have supplies to treat MH in all of locations where sucks could be used, uh, let alone volatiles. Uh, we will make an effort to review additional society statements on this. In principle, in locations where volatiles or sucks are used, is it required to have treatment for MH in that location? In favor? Not in favor? Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that if we're going to talk about um, rescue for this, we should probably have something about intralipid for local anesthetic toxicity. Uh, um, and um, it's not just having the supplies, but also the staff training, which is really where uh, the pain point is for a lot of um, yeah. non-OR locations. Are you trying to steal my thunder on a new item? Thank you for the comments on this one. This is a suggested deletion from feedback yesterday. I think at this point we're inclined to delete it. Is, does anyone feel strong, strongly to keep this one? Okay, we will plan to delete that one. Number nine, infusion pumps. <laughs> In favor here? This one usually gets a pretty tepid response. <laughs> anyone opposed? I think since I have the microphone, the updated drug library is still where I have the yep. pain point. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. Could you just reword it that if you're going to use an infusion pump, we recommend yes. the updated library? Yes, I think that's a nice qualifier for that. Do we want to encourage dose error reduction software? 
I think that I kind of consider those synonymous with okay. drug library, but I think that you, using DERS is a, is a more descriptive term. Yeah. Do all pumps have update? Do all pumps have drug libraries? In practice, no, they don't. I would say most at this point. I think man pumps manufactured today almost invariably do. Oh yeah, manufactured today, yeah. but in practice. Yes, that's that's yeah. true. There's a lot of legacy yeah. products that are out yeah. there for sure. We will work on this one. But it's not going to happen everywhere. They don't have a farm. This is a substantial there. revision that involves equipment that's unlikely to be used in many settings, including office-based anesthesia. Before we even vote, any thoughts on this? In favor? Not opposed, though. So it's, it, there's value in having point of care ultrasound available in certain locations, whether it be for regional anesthesia or for securing difficult IV access. We recognize not all locations are going to be able to have that, but hoping to at least elevate the importance of the technology to provide providers who are advocating for it kind of additional leverage to try to secure it as part of their budget planning, whatever it may be. What's that? Yeah, that too. Yeah, but yep. the point of care ultrasound, the POCUS. No, these are these are great points you're making. I was just saying the wording of that is just a little bit confusing, and maybe if you turn it around the other way, that at Nora locations, point of care ultrasound equipment is recommended where vascular access and or nerve blocks yep. are utilized, or so, you know something along those lines. Because the way this reads, I don't think that. It, okay. I don't understand. Thank that. you. Yeah, maybe just simply say something like point of care ultrasound equipment can be useful to assist in vascular access and, you know, placing nerve blocks. Yep. Because I don't think that's a standard of care, it right, certainly, for anything. It, to my knowledge, is not a standard of care right. for And location. first off, it's just a really difficult to read sentence. But yep. I think a lot of it's just that, you know, just make that suggestion. As, so you said that people kind of, oh, yeah, maybe I should do this. I just think, just state the fact that it may be useful or it may yep. be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Here in front, Lynn. JW, I just don't think that this has the same power or um, urgency as some of the, as most of the other things that we're writing on. And I don't think it's practical for, for in, in many, if not most locations, particularly yep. stuff that's not in the hospital. So um, I, I would rethink the whole, I would, it's an awkward sentence, but I would, I would rethink it even as a process as it doesn't belong with the rest of what we're doing here. Why don't we rephrase the vote? Uh, who's in favor of removing this item from the recommendations? That was more that had approved it. Why don't we just move to strike this one? Thank you all for the feedback. Here's another one that's going to be going to read a similar awkward way. There was a story, a story shared this morning about needing, our, needing to transduce an arterial line in a neural location, but that was in a hospital. Do people believe this belongs in these recommendations? Any similar response to uh, our discussion with ultrasound? In favor of this one, show of hands. Looks like we got three of us. <laughs> Four of us. Five of us. Uh, opposed? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Rich. Yep. In the large hospital setting, we should have no problem accessing these, right? You know, so that's, I think, the issue here is people are thinking, where are we? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Which look. think in a large hospital setting, there exists a barrier to getting an arterial blood pressure monitor in your 
Well, there is, but that's why we're writing these, I think, that people think about it a little bit more and maybe, you know, I increase access to these things. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my point. But. Well, that, I mean, that's my question. Like, is there a barrier to that? Well, I think the issue is sometimes it's, it takes time to get these things because we don't have them readily available. Thinking about a, like a, a big it's place. It takes time to get an ultrasound in an operating room, too. That's true. So I would say that this is like just seems to be way above where. Well, this may be something that's more going to be solved by having your NORA designated liaison who's going to think about you know, who's going to be able to advocate for the things that you need in yep. NORA specific to your site. Yeah, and I'd be careful of that because, I mean, I remember when we set up an OBA office at Northwestern for the first time, and literally people wanted to have, like, you know, ECMO machines. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because, oh, my gosh, what if, what if, what if, right? And at some point, I think we have to realize that if a patient really needs those kinds of things, and they maybe don't, shouldn't be in a NORA location, right? Yep. And that this is the practice truly of anesthesiology. Um, Thank you. One, we got one more comment, and then we're going to. I also think, it, um, referencing back to some of the talks this morning, hemodynamic instability, most anesthesia causes hemodynamic instability. So there's a drop of blood pressure of 20 points, hemodynamic instability, and now the dental office needs an arterial line. I think that's unreasonable. Yep. Thank you. We're going to move on from this one. This one I'm not going to suggest that we delete. I'm just going to suggest that we revisit it. Access to testing. In favor here? Opposed? Any, anyone is share, uh, please share any reasons for opposition if you'd like, no obligation to at all. In a GI setting, a lot of times we don't have, um, we don't need those um, like a CBC or additional testing for the procedure or even like for an eye procedure. Thank you. Oh, pregnancy, yes, we do need that for the childbearing. Any other comments on this one? <laughs> Dr. Dutton? I, I like the inclusion of appropriate for the patient population because I think it solves that okay. question. Different centers need dis different testing requirements. Thank you. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that that helps me much. I, I, I still think that, I mean, if you're going to an ambulatory surgery center or are you going to a, a, a NORA site, you know, should you have your pregnancy test before you go? You know, aren't these lab tests things that can be done before you get there as opposed to insisting that they be on site? Um, I, I can't recall, you know, in an, particularly in, in, in a in real outpatient kind of NORA settings where I've ever used any of these, and um, and to to say that somebody has to have them, because, you know, uh, again, we can break the system. You can spend too much money here, and if we start if we start to make recommendations that are impractical to be implemented in a large number of sites, we're doomed to fail. Um, and the association of a poor recommendation with a bunch of good ones can um, sour the rest of the barrel a little bit. And I think you have to be careful about that. So this is one like the, you know, getting an arterial line. I, I'm sorry, but, you know, you do an arterial line in a, in a dentist's office, you know, to what purpose and who would ever do that? And, you know, has it ever been done before? So it's not that you can't, I mean, you can do all of these things, but you shouldn't. And we shouldn't make a, a, a recommendation to do things that we shouldn't be doing. Thank you. If you I mean, remove the example, would it make a difference? Because again, as Dr. Dutton said, testing appropriate for the population. That was going to be my suggestion. Or the as well, procedure. Then. Yeah, and I do think that by having timely access in there, it actually does make it so that if you're getting your urine pregnancies the day before, that's timely. It doesn't need to be on site. You you have made an arrangement for it. So, I, yeah, I think if we get rid of the specific the second sentence and we just say timely access 
to diagnostic or point of care testing, so whatever your process, it just makes you think about a process. Know that like if your patient needs a lab I don't have on site, I'm gonna send them the day before. If I have it on site, I don't need to send them the day before. Um, so it just, I feel like it forces people to make a process and think about this. Thank you for the comments. Sorry, no, I repeat what I said if you have not heard me. I said all these great comments and, and points that were made rightfully could have been uh, avoided had we separated the areas from in-hospital Nora versus other outpatient areas, because these are all great points and they're all correct and, and wonderful. And it just mixing multiple areas that serve different populations for different acuity level makes it very difficult for us to come up with unified recommendations. Yeah. It is Thank more you. challenging, for sure. Okay. Go ahead, Rich. Yep. Ultrasound, and maybe we could just have one statement that incorporates like three of the other statements, including this one, that just says timely access to testing, monitoring equipment. What else was there? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yep. Uh, per, per, based on your patient population and procedure, maybe something like that. Again, we can work on it it's later. It's a but great suggestion. A suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, I mean, everybody, others, for the comments. I'm just combining what others have said. I'm advancing the slide deck. Blood loss. In favor? Remember, this is not final concepts. Okay, anyone opposed? Anyone want to share any um, concerns? I think it would help to split out in hospital versus out of hospital. Even in this statement, you could say it in hospital, yeah. nor locations, yep. or a combination like Dr. Irwin suggested. Thank you. Why only in hospital locations? But that's even more reason to have it. So I, there's a lot of freestanding ambulatory surgery centers that are completely remote that are doing big operations. They have their own blood banking. Freestanding ones do not have access to CBCs, hemoglobin constant measurements, or, you know, actually set up to deliver. Great discussion. Thank you. Oh. I actually like the wording of neural locations where procedures may result, and maybe that can be applied to the suggest suggestion Rich had. Neural locations where procedures may require then ultrasound, arterial line, and point of care could be. So I think the wording kind of. Yeah, I think that's a nice middle road also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nora in MRI. In favor? Anyone opposed? We're, it's a should, and it's going to depend on facility, how many suites they're going to have and how many machines they're going to want to have that are MRI compatible, as one example. These things are 100,000 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you need an ambu bag, you need a monitor, <laughs> and you need some yeah. drugs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, these are these are great points. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next one. This is a new one related to feedback yesterday, local anesthetic toxicity. Yeah. In favor? No. Yeah, what I struggle with that wording. What would you think? Cuz it's not just skin infiltration at the surgical site. 
Right. Anything more than for sub Q access or something like that, or IV access. They give the wrong dose. Yes. They give the wrong also dose. True. They, they do a paracervical block that's two cc's, not sufficient to cause last, maybe, but if it's directly IV. Okay, we will work on that wording, which was not, uh, did not just flow out of my keyboard last night. Okay, we're gonna keep this one. All right, now we're into today's content, and believe it or not, I actually think we're doing pretty good on time, but we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit. Um, teamwork number one, staff and teamwork number one in favor? Anyone opposed here? We're on to number two. Let's just focus on some of these as adequate staff. In favor of adequate staff. Okay, anybody opposed on this one? This one isn't gonna be easy. How about ACLS and PALS? In favor of a statement which includes a mention of ACLS or PALS? In favor? And let's just say that is the anesthesia personnel. How about in favor of someone at the Nora site also being ACLS or PALS certified? Okay, so I think we, should, we ought to include both of them in this. Yeah, Rich? Clarification, so what you're saying, there should be at least two individuals who are ACLS certified. Is that what we're saying? One being anesthesia person. Um, I guess I'm thinking more of a proceduralist. Uh, I guess we don't want to be, because it does say nursing, nursing staff. And as you know, that's not the case in many, many places, whether it's hospital-based yeah. or you know, surgery center or whatever it is. So I, I guess the question is, do we want to say ACLS or some sort of resuscitation training, which could be BLS? I know it's not the same, but um, I guess what kind of level, uh, you know, I, I guess my question is about nursing staff, because that will be controversial. I'm not yeah. saying we shouldn't be try to be controversial, but uh, that, that's my question, whether we okay. need to say ACLS or some sort of, re, be more generic about resuscitation. Yep. Uh, I agree with that. So I think it's important here that we reflect that the people present are capable of resuscitating the patient. We'll get into the finer, de finer details on the next revision. Uh, checklist has been replaced as of today, I think, by manual. Was that the preferred term? We're also going to be striking the second line. We're not going to define specific conditions. We're going to be saying crisis manuals shall be available and clearly visible in NORA locations as applicable for the patient population and procedure type, something like that. In could favor? We, yeah, could we add training? <laughs> What's that? Training with the uh, checklist. Good point, Lynn. Yeah. The, these kinds of emergencies happen so uh, infrequent in these neural locations, I think we need to list what the minimal checklists are that they should have okay. access to. These are life-threatening emergencies, and everyone should have that job aid because they are not going to know inherently what to do. I, I think we should at least, you know, and if we're going to do that, even just saying as a minimal, at least these five things, you know, um, and I think we should add blood, um, blood loss, uh, excessive blood loss or something as a checklist. Sorry. Thank you for, for raising that point. One of the suggestions we had was potentially putting a link to the EMC where they have a, a website where they have all the checklists and manuals and things like that. So it gives people an action item and something they can actually take home with them from these guidelines. That's a great point. Thank you. Any other comments on this one? All right, moving on. This one, I believe, is going to be removed. No, I um, think. 
considered part of the process anyway. Um, does any, I think I was maybe in group five's room when this had been discussed, or group four's room. Did anyone suggest to remove this? I feel like I heard that discussion. I, oh, go ahead. And I agreed with the discussion oh. I heard. In group four, we discussed deleting yep. this. And was, it, was some of this content considered repetitive of, rec of content that's coming? Correct. Yeah, okay. we can buy, in the virtual group, we had edits that we already sent to you. Okay. So, so at this combining, time, I'm going to yeah. suggest that we're going to be removing five. Anyone strongly feel five ought to remain at this point? Okay, as of right now, we're going to look for content similar to five and plan on striking five. This is the liaison question. Complicated outside of the hospital where a department of anesthesia may not exist, so we need to figure out a better way to uh, identify this person. All in favor of someone as being kind of the representative for anesthesia services at each NORA site? In favor of this? Opposed? My only comment is that the vast majority of anesthetics are not done in academic hospitals, and Department of Anesthesia means nothing at those hospitals. So um, maybe like a director of NORA, like just leave that, but yep. Department of Anesthesia just kind of falls flat in these like yep. rural Understood. and smaller hospitals. Thank you. We're going to rephrase this, but keep the idea of a dedicated person. Oh. Question? Thank you. Yep. That comment was liaison, should have a parenthesis S at the end of it. One of the things we talked about was that a director of NORA, again, thinking about the wide scope that you're, you're going for, it means nothing at, like the, clin at the, the small clinics and the offices. There's no director. Often, again, anesthesia is often a contractor. So some sort of concept of, of this is the right idea, but just directors, when it's not a staff member, is often going to be lost on those small yep. staffs. Thank you. Sorry, I've got one more. <laughs> I'm back. Um, we talk a lot about what this director should do, but many times they're kind of voluntold to do it without being given the resources, meaning the authority, the time, and or the compensation to do all of these things, which can be very um, a lot of emotional work in addition to a lot of um, just tasky type work. Thank you. Thank you. How about a dedicated Nora anesthesia team should be considered? In favor? Opposed to including this? Here. Works yep. in a hospital, doesn't work elsewhere, and you add the term hospital uh, associated NORA sites because that's where you're really talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So this one's going to be reconsidered for whether or not we will include it. Yep, good idea. Thank you. Okay, so, moving on here. Sorry, as, as promised, you can't shut me up. That that last one, actually, though, I think is important in the non in the clinics, in the solo practitioner, small office space, because that's where we see a lack of communication with anesthesia, right? So even if there's not a dedicated Nora team, even if there's contract anesthesia, and if per diem nurses and things like that, that communication is all the more important because of the gaps that occur. So I don't think you want to lose that and and dedicate it only to the hospital. You just need to make it work in the right way. Okay for those clinics because that's where the, the communication is actually more critical in, in our experience. Thank you. This one's new from last night, that we believe that procedurals departments in our locations should also have a point of con a dedicated point of contact. In favor?
Opposed? I'm going to move, we're going to move um, just on the interest of time. This one's going to stay for now. We have opportunity to uh, um, revise it. Okay, we are not going to have sufficient time to, to complete these, but we're just going to keep going for a couple more minutes. Number one in pre-op and patient selection. In favor? Opposed? Number two is identifying specific conditions that should trigger additional pre-op evaluation or perhaps scheduling that procedure in a certain location. In favor? Opposed? Going to the next one. Before we move off of that one, maybe we need something in there about patient consent and that pre, I just didn't see that anywhere really um, in the pre-op area. Just to add consent. Somehow, yep. procedural consent process, blah, blah. And I'm going to say it, that number four, um, we have more wrong site procedures in neural locations than in the OR. The OR has it right. So we've got to include verification of site. Um, or an alter with site marking and or an alternative as it in addition to that timeout. We have got to have that language in there. Um, too much opportunity in these non-OR locations for wrong site procedures. Thank you. I had to get that in. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. This says perceived to belong in the equipment section. In principle, should this be included? In favor? Opposed? We're going to move it to equipment. This was a long one. In the written materials, do we call out specifically patients with sleep apnea and elevated BMIs as a specific item in the NORA recommendations, I think is what we're going for here. So in favor of calling it out, sleep apnea and elevated BMI. Show of hands. Opposed? Mayor for Rick, please. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to ask and put you on the spot. Any comments on anyone who's opposed here? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. Time out. I'm just going to go past this one, but we are going to ensure that we include site marking. Here's one about calling out specifically new procedures, complicated procedures, new staff. Should this be included in our NOR recommendations? In favor? It needs modified. Conceptually, it's... It's good. Yeah. some sort of proper preparation, education, discussion, planning. Thank you. It's in the virtual group comment. Okay, thank you. We're going to keep this. It's going to be reworded. I'm going to go past this one. This also uh, was very close to unanimous agreement in favor. Anyone have any comments here? expand on that it, it needs to be a, a, a formal system for EMS personnel if I'm in an off-site five miles away from a hospital office I need to have emergency I, ha I need to have a really established way I can do that so I think we should expand a little bit on that not just assistance emergent assistance emergency response and little, transport, and transport. You there policy. you go you have a policy yeah, yeah. thank you for accreditation. 
How about this one, similar to the last one? Can it be combined with the last one? Yeah. I think yes. we're going to combine this. Yeah. Post-op. Any, any, anyone opposed to this one? Rich? Not opposed, but the more I think about it, I mean, there's lots of standards that are in these days that the courts are including and people didn't even say it. I'm just bringing it up. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. It starts recording. Oh, okay. I, my question is, you know, we mentioned obviously pre-op standards, and I, unless we're adding something more to it, then that's what it is out there. I, yep. I, I just don't know. How do other people feel about it? I mean, it's a, okay. it's a right statement to make, but it's already out there. Okay. So, Thank you, Rich. Yeah. We are in the post-op section. We're going to set appropriate discharge criteria. This is probably going to be combined with the previous. We will revisit this with this group. We'll revisit this one. There's falls and VT, fall prevention here, and VTE is the next one. There seems to be some interest in keeping these in. We're going to reword them when we circulate the next draft. This one, I don't know if we want to go here. Um, we are not going to resolve it in the next minute, which is what I have. Responsible adult, we're going to look for other type of applicable guidelines. Sorry, one moment. And we've got two CQI suggestions here. These have been reworded. They are going to come to you in the next draft. So we did our best with some IT issues. Everyone here had to vote with their hands, which was not my intention, but I sincerely appreciate all of you sharing your opinions and then also standing up and speaking your minds. It makes a huge difference for us to get that feedback. I do think we're able to stick to the concepts and not look for perfection. And as I mentioned, we're going to have a follow-up. We're going to have the draft recommendations back to you again in the fall and probably use a survey tool as well to kind of gauge agreement with various things. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dan Cole, who's going to wrap us up. Thank you all very much. Yeah, as, as we knew ahead of time, this was a big, big uh, topic. And uh, we could have spent a week uh, trying to uh, figure out this uh, topic. But we're clearly at a better spot now than we were a week ago. Uh, and so thank you all for the high engagement. I do want to again thank the uh, planning committee, Stacy Maxwell, the speakers, and particularly, most of all, a highly engaged uh, group that uh, had uh, a lot of participation in developing this uh, recommendation. Again, like JW said, our intent is to be inclusive and uh, send these out again to you, get as much input as we can, and put a final document out there that will impact quality and safety and make a difference. And again, safe trip home, and thank you again for attending.